now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Thursday, November 8, 2018. I invite you to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Danielle Williams. We will then remain silent, uh, remain silent, remain standing for a moment of silence, and I ask that you all remember the senseless, senseless deaths in Thousand Oaks, California. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First item on this evening's agenda is uh, to consider this evening's agenda. Mrs. White, are there any additions or changes to it? Mr. Chair, there are no changes or additions. Hearing none, the agenda Chair? stands. Mrs. Miller. I move that the board add an agenda item to discuss the modified motion to protect system records from destruction. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Yes. Um, this is something that's been going on now for, I guess, about two months, uh, at least six six weeks or two months um, since we modified our directive and there are outstanding questions um, plus uh, concerns about how the new directive uh, you know what the impact actually is and what it actually means to the system uh, so i think that's something we need to discuss as a board in open session okay um the uh, motion to amend the agenda requires unanimity. All in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. Uh, there are four, and that's not unanimous, so it fails. All right. Earlier this evening, uh, so the, uh, I'm sorry, the agenda stands as presented. Uh, earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To discuss, one, the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. And seven, mm -hmm. consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. The minutes of the closed session and informal summary can be found at our website at www.bcps.org slash board slash informational dash summaries dot html. Next on our agenda is um, a selection of speakers. Sign-up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Uh, board practice limits to 10, uh, the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Each speaker is allowed up to three minutes to address the board. The completed sign-up cards for this evening have been placed in the box to my right, and Ms. Adekoya is going to draw the names, and Mr. Stewart will read the names. Thank you. Our first is Howard Libet. <coughs> Second is Andrew Brilla. Third is David Magrogan. Fourth is Dana Bergman. Fifth is, pardon me, Sandra Wazalewski. And that is all that, so everyone that put a card in is going to speak this evening. The next item on our agenda is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. Uh, the members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. Uh, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent uh, if needed. Uh, while we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board and the system, this is not the uh, proper place or time to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. Uh, I remind everyone uh, the three-minute timer, um, and uh, which will let you know when your time is up. Um, I'll now call on our advisory and stakeholder groups uh, who have signed up to speak. And the first one is from the Baltimore County Student Council, the Superintendent's Student Advisory Council, Ruben Amaya. Good evening. Good evening. Good 
Good evening, members of the board. First, after the wild roller coaster we all rode on election night, I would like to congratulate the new Board of Education. Though most importantly, I want to say thank you to all the students who participated by volunteering, door knocking, phone banking, you name it. It's important youth stay engaged in the political process and better understand the issues we face firsthand. I'm excited for the amazing things BCSE has been able to do and is still working on. One of my favorite opportunities I have taken is visiting schools along with Halima and our representatives Zach Zimin, Sahib Kar, Brittany Grubb, Shane Shakur, and Nisha Shah. Hearing the stories and passions of other students is what inspires us every day to be there for them and ensure we give 110%. Many of us tell their aspirations while others their struggles. And that is why I'm in, I am proud to work with such amazing leadership right here in front of me and faculty throughout BCPS so that students one day no longer face the barriers they experience today. We are also working on initiatives that are focused, that are focused on technology use, health, and the physical safety of students. Even though October is over, I want to give a shout out to student Andrew Gersh for his work in communities and wanting to pursue new initiatives with Halima and BCPS TV to expand our anti-bullying initiatives. Currently, our main focus is preparing for the December General Assembly and finding new ways to better represent students. I hope that with this board and the new board, we can continue to work together to ensure students are at the forefront of every decision. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is from TABCO, and that's Abby Baton. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Vice Chairman Stewart, Ms. White, and members of the board. Congratulations to the winners in Tuesday's elections, and a great big thank you to those who chose to run even if they were not successful. A vibrant nation needs to have people willing to serve, whether it is for a seat on the school board, county council, as governor of our state, or any other number of races. It is up to our citizens to vote and elect these candidates and then hold them accountable for the work they do. Now that the election is behind us, we look forward to our continued collaboration with the current and the future Board of Education. We know we are all here to make sure we can provide the best for our students. Our collaboration helps foster those best practices and outcomes. We know there are many challenges coming on this school board and we wish everyone, everyone who will be continuing on the board, as well as those who will be new to the board, great success. I personally want to thank the outgoing school board members who will be turning over the reins of this work to the new board in, in December. Anyone who is willing to put in the hard work required for this position should be applauded by all. So thank you. I will leave all of you with a reminder that whatever the decisions you make, your mantra should always be, is this decision right for our students? We know that our teacher voices need to be in the conversations and at the table always. We understand how important our role is in our students' education. We also know that without other stakeholder voices, parents, students, and community members, this work cannot be accomplished. So thank you to all of you for your continued hard work and sacrifices on behalf of our students, and I hope that I will see many of you tomorrow night at our TABCO 100-year celebration. So thank you. Our next speaker is from the Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee, Megan Stewart-Sicking. Chairman Gillis, Vice Chairman Stewart, Ms. White, and members of the board, good evening to all of you. Since it's on the agenda tonight, I want to begin with transportation. There is a strategic collaborative plan between the offices of special education and transportation addressing the following areas. Collaboration between offices, professional learning, route analysis, and recruitment and retention of drivers and attendants. The Office of Special Education and Transportation meet formally throughout the year, in addition to many informal meetings or conversations throughout each school day. There is continued review of ride times and route design, and disability awareness and specialized training has been provided to drivers and attendants. There are many good outcomes and success stories we don't often get to hear, and there is certainly room for improvement, as I'm sure we will hear. To that end, I want to ask you specifically for three things. First, learn more about the Office of Special Ed and Transportation Collaboration to gain knowledge about successes and challenges and to ensure resources for continued improvement. 
Second, use resources from the new climate office to support ongoing training so drivers are equipped with skills to support all students. And finally, support requests for more drivers and attendants while examining wages and other issues to support recruitment and retention. Our CCAC meeting Monday night focused on the issue of transition. We always appreciate seeing executive directors from different zones at our meetings, so I'd like to thank Karen Blannard for attending, along with many other BCPS staff. Secondary transition is one of four initiatives MSDE has targeted in the state to enhance outcomes for students. BCPS includes it as part of the strategic plan to increase graduation rates for students with disabilities, decrease the dropout rate for students with IEPs, and prepare students for college, career, and community. Currently, caseloads of the 16 transition facilitators average 450 students at multiple high schools and middle schools. Four transition facilitators servicing students with functional needs average 150 in their caseload, including developing and monitoring work-based learning sites in the community. All transition facilitators are responsible for a huge amount of administration and support. Frankly, the caseloads are ridiculous, especially given both the state and BCPS focus on transition and entry to adulthood is an overwhelming challenge for so many. Our students simply aren't always ready for life after school. Please consider carefully in the budget request that additional transition facilitators are required to reduce caseloads so that transition facilitators can assume a more active role in transition planning for our students. Thank you very much. Uh, now time for public comment and our first speaker is Howard Libet. Thank you. My, my name is Howard Libet. I'm the executive director of the Baltimore Jewish Council. I'm here tonight uh, reflecting on the horrific shooting from two weekends ago in Pittsburgh and to say thank you to the Baltimore County Schools for your partnership with us and helping educate students and teachers about the Holocaust, about hate, about anti-Semitism. Next week will be the sixth annual Lessons of the Shoah held each, each November at the John Carroll School in Bel Air. Hundreds of students and teachers from public, private, and parochial schools in Baltimore County, Baltimore City, and the region come together for a day of Holocaust study and dialogue for high school students and their teachers. This year, I believe five uh, Baltimore County schools will be joining, Chesapeake, Hereford, Lock Raven, Patapsco, and Towson. And we thank the county schools for providing two buses to help get them there. That, we all know that transportation is expensive. We put money toward it, but the county schools are, are extremely helpful. Since the late 1990s, the council has been working with the Baltimore County Public Schools on Holocaust workshops for teachers. Uh, for the past, no, for a number of summers now, we hold the Summer Teachers Institute that includes opportunities for continuing education credit. There are always Baltimore County uh, teachers enrolled in that program. We're also grateful for the opportunity to participate in the August Professional Development Day, Professional Study Day for the Department of Social Studies. It, another valuable opportunity for us to reach teachers. And finally, a number of schools take advantage of the opportunity to have us coordinate having survivors come and speak to students and speak in classes, middle school, high school most commonly. And we often, as these survivors are getting older, even find ways to drive them there. Um, we're already working with some of their children to ensure that the second generation will also be able to provide eyewitness testimony. Because we all know that in this era where people question what they read and question fake news, hearing the stories directly from survivors is so powerful. And we know that the only way we're gonna stamp out hate and fight anti-Semitism is to teach our children. So thank you again to the Baltimore County Public Schools for helping us with this partnership. Our next speaker is Andrew Brilla. Uh, good evening. Uh, Congratulations, uh, thank you for giving me the chance to speak on the board. Uh, I want to address the issue on Baltimore County transportation. I go to Sellers Point High in the morning and uh, Kenwood High in the afternoon. And the issue is overcrowding on the bus and lateness. First of all, for the first two years, I'm 10th grade, for the first two years, our bus driver said to us that she is never on time. That's the first thing she said to us last year, first thing she said to us this year. And it's sad that we get to school every day. We go to a magnet school that we tested to get in and we're excited to go to. 
and do what we want to do, but we're late every single day. Some days the bus is overcrowded, some days it's not. Some days there's elementary school kids on the bus, some days there's not. It depends who's on the bus and who's not. I've tried last year, the bus was overcrowded. It went to four stops, Kenwood High, uh, Hawthorne Elementary, Middle River Middle, and Orms Elementary. Went to the principal the next week, it was fixed, but technically it wasn't fixed because I went back to my uh, original bus stop and uh, sadly it wasn't a full bus and it was like one of those short half buses and we were still overcrowded on both of the buses even though it was from four stops down to two. So it's still continuing this year and I think this issue needs to be addressed and we need to put more money into the transportation and more money to the bus drivers that drive us and more respect to these bus drivers because they do a lot for these kids and they want to get these kids on time to school. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is David uh, McGrogan. This way, Mr. Gillis, board. Good evening. My name's Dave McGrogan. I'm an AFSCME Southeast shop steward, bus driver, and trained uh, uh, attendant. I'm here today on behalf of the children that ride with me every day. Just like the child that just left and complained about the bus service, I live and breathe the bus service. We have a fundamental root systemic cause of a lot of these problems in the last few years. A new software program came on about three years ago and slowly encroached into our system. It was blessed and would fix a lot of our problems supposedly down the road. It hasn't. It has created all new problems. Just like the boy just left here, overcrowded, uh, always late, why is this happening? Well, the software that ha we have at our lot, they can pie it into little pieces, routing. They have dummy runs and they can pie it to little pieces. Basically, they can squeeze in this run on that run, this run on that run, replace this driver with this. Uh, it creates complete havoc at the driver attendant level. It looks good in the firmware and the software because we move these many kids. Doesn't say how late, doesn't say what time, doesn't say anything about that, and it doesn't give anything to the driver's pressure. He's unbelievable amount of pressure trying to get it done. So when the software drives us to do that, we do all things to be on time, making U-turns in the wrong place, speeding, things we shouldn't be doing, we're doing, only to make this software, make our route work the way it's given it to us. And every day it's a new route. Everybody, every parent knows that the first week of school was always just a disaster with bus and transportation until we learn the routes, we fix this, we fix that, we tweak this, tweak that. Well, it's gotten to the point that every week is the first week of school. Every time I get a new route sheet, I get a new set of kids, I never met them before. I've been on probably 25 buses in the last, since the beginning of the year. I'm assigned to a bus. I was on it for four days. And since then, I've had 25 different assignments. Uh, that is the root of a lot of the problems that we're having and we're seeing with the kids, the parents, and everybody, just simply because it's too much on the plate, even though the plate looks like it's empty on the software. Thank you. Our next speaker is Diana Bergman. Good evening, everybody. I have a feeling that tonight's gonna be a good night. So I posted earlier, because I came earlier to see the Buildings and Contract Committee, and I got to listen in on some of the topics regarding transportation. I know that we're getting extra money, new money, to help make our transportation system a little safer. So we have this BCPS Transportation Advocacy Group I've met lots of friends on there. 
and um, I posted this. Super excited to hear about the extra funding coming to make our school buses safer and the radio communication to come back with full technology updated equipment. So far, it really looks good to see much needed supports kicking in. Positive, great, great way to look at making things better. So here's the feedback that I'm seeing. Everybody has their listening ears on? Okay. Radios might be talking to an empty seat. They need to address the dedicated employees who are overworked and underpaid. We need drivers, not updated radio technology. Right, somebody said yes. Update equipment won't fix our problem of being understaffed. The budget needs to also provide higher pay for drivers or everyone will keep leaving to the driver companies that pay way more. And it goes on and on and on and on. And this is a com group of c people communicating right now actively on social media, from parents to bus drivers to our attendants, about our children. What I see here is not so much negative and positive, but I do see people working together. And if we're going to be better and improve our transportation system, we all have to work together. It's very important we work together. So I spoke to our head of transportation department. He's in the room. Hey. Hi, Dave. Very nice guy. I like him. And he said he promises to work together. I think one of the most important thing that we need to think about is how we communicate to improve ourselves and improve our system. Make sure our drivers and attendants have the tools that they need and make sure that we keep them and we hire what we need. So we have to find that balancing system somehow. But I'm really excited because I think moving forward, somehow, some way, we will work together and make Baltimore County better. So that's my feedback tonight regarding transportation. And congratulations to all the new upcoming board members and all the hard work from our current board members. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sandra Wazalewski. Good evening. Good evening. I'm a little nervous. This is my first time. Sorry. I've been driving a school bus for 19 years. And my concern is a shortage of drivers. Drivers' starting salary is $15.73 an hour. Bus attendants start out at $10.72 an hour. Also, there is many days during the school year we do not get paid. Professional study days we do not get paid. Some in climate weather days we do not get paid. And some days during holiday, Christmas holiday vacations we do not get paid. We just had a school bus driver leave. She left to go to a trash truck company for more than $4, four dollars more an hour than she was making with Baltimore County driving precious cargo. I don't understand this because we do drive precious cargo. Also, we are on and off the clock throughout the day, sometimes four times a day. We are off for 25 minutes, then back on, which means your day consists of about 11 hours, but you're only pay, paid for eight hours. Sometimes, what I'm trying to say is sometimes you do your run, you start at six, you come back to a lot at nine, you're off the clock. You go back, you do a run at maybe 9.50, you're back on the clock. You're done your run at, say, 10.30, you're back off the clock. Then you go, you're back on the clock. So you're under Baltimore County's umbrella for 11 hours, but you're physically only getting paid for eight. This is why we are doubling, tripling, and overcrowding on the buses. It's not fair to the students, students or the bus drivers, and it's also not safe. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Uh, so we're at item F on our agenda, the superintendent's report. I invite Mrs. White to speak. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So good evening. This is my last superintendent's report to the current Board of Education. So I would like to start uh, with a heartfelt appreciation for our board members. 
Uh, you've volunteered to represent your, our communities, to work for children, uh, to, and to advocate for public education. So I want to let you know how thankful I am for your service to our students um, and to our schools. And to our board officers, I'd like to express my gratitude to you as well for your leadership over the past year. So please join me in thanking our board members for their service. It is also my pleasure to welcome our officials elected to serve Baltimore County this past Tuesday. It is a pleasure to congratulate our incoming uh, county executive as well, uh, Johnny Oshevsky Jr. Um, and I look forward to working with him to continue our strong partnership with county government. Next month, the first hybrid Board of Education will be seated, and I would like to acknowledge our elected members by Councilmanic District. So uh, congratulations and welcome to District 1, Lisa Mack. District, yes, very good. <laughs> and if you're in the room, you can stand. If you're in the room, Lisa Mack, okay. <laughs> uh, District 2, Cheryl Pasteur. District 3, Kathleen Causey. <laughs> District 4, Makita Scott. <laughs> District 5, Julie Hen. <laughs> District 6, Lily Rowe. <laughs> and District 7, Rod, Rod McMillian. Thank you for being here tonight and congratulations again. I would also like to take a moment to recognize County Executive Don Moeller for his leadership and his steadfast support to our schools. Um, during Hillcrest Elementary's 50th anniversary celebration, County Executive Moeller was inspired by a bulletin board which provided seven key reminders and he was really struck by and that he brought to my attention as well. And those seven key reminders were, use kind words, help others, share and take turns, listen, be honest, think before acting, and forgive others. So he shared these reminders with county leaders and he has them posted on his door. And I think it's an important reminder for all of us to let kindness and cooperation guide our work as we move forward. Speaking of our work, I had the pleasure of meeting with our system leaders recently, both school-based and central office leaders, to congratulate them on a job well done with regard to our accomplishments this year. Uh, for instance, West Towson Elementary School just had their blue ribbon ceremony in Washington, D.C. today. So again, another congratulations to West Towson. And I it reminded our team how proud I am of them for um, this, some remarkable accomplishments, including opening three new schools on time and within budget, which is no small feat, uh, creating inward and outward facing data dashboards for organizational efficiency and transparency, reshaping professional learning opportunities for staff, revising curriculum, expanding student behavior initiatives, implementing academic and nutritional programs to support the whole child and reorganizing the system to increase our focus on academic monitoring and on school behavior, student behavior and school safety. And the list goes on and on. Tonight, I am pleased to announce another team accomplishment for our children. Recently, I asked the team to explore ways in which that we might expand on our career and workforce development opportunities for our students. As a result, we will be launching the BCPS Works Initiative to strengthen our apprenticeship and workforce development program. BCPS Works will be led by an apprenticeship coordinator who will be responsible for communicating between and among offices of college and career readiness, CTE, counseling, as well as the Baltimore County Department of Economic and Workforce Development in support of the Apprenticeship Maryland CTE program, which has been endorsed by Governor Hogan. The BCPS Works Initiative will focus on financial literacy, entrepreneurship, youth internships, and apprenticeships. We will continue to partner with those in the business community to offer authentic, real-world experiences for our young people from elementary to high school. 
I am proud of our team for pulling together these components in a way that is aligned with industry standards, but is, that is also fiscally responsible. We will be using grant funds to secure the position, which will not require any additional full-time uh, employees in the operating budget, but will be one that will be critically important to providing that gift with purchase that we talk about as students graduate, not only with the diploma, but also with the resume and creating those pathways for them. So to our team who really pulled together on uh, this initiative to really get this up and running, I say thank you to the team. With regard to our team, I'd also like to acknowledge our support professionals. We know that it takes many hands and minds to support the growth and achievement of our students. Every year, we, we set aside two days to recognize our education support professionals who play key roles in our classrooms and our offices, including office professionals, computer support professionals, classroom paraeducators, health assistants, sign language interpreters, and residency investigators. Yesterday was BCPS Education Support Professionals Day and the national celebration of ESP Day is next Wednesday, November 14th, during American Education Week. And speaking of American Education Week, I hope that parents have a chance to visit their child's classroom from November 12th through the 16th to experience our approach to teaching and learning firsthand. Please check with your child's school for recommended times and special events. Also coming up on our calendar, Thanksgiving will be here before we know it. And I, I says this is kind of my last report before then. Um, I hope that you all will have a wonderfully relaxing and restful holiday. And I must say how thankful I am uh, to be a part of BCPS and to be a part of such a remarkable team. Schools and offices will be closed on November 22nd and 23rd. Finally, I'll end tonight with our highest priority. We all agree that nothing is more important than the safety and security of our children. Tonight's video highlights our most recent updates and improvements to proactively ensure that our working and learning environments are safe, including the creation of our division of school climate and safety. So let's show our story. School climate and safety is so valuable for our students at BCPS so they can be successful in and out of the school building. With the forward thinking of our interim superintendent, Verlita White, she implemented the Division of School Climate and Safety. Within the division, we also have the department and the offices uh, that work collectively to meet the needs of our students. We have school counselors, pupil personnel workers, the superintendent's designee, our school nurses, our school psychologists, as well as our school social workers. All of these offices together work collectively to meet the needs of the whole child, which is what our primary emphasis is on, meeting the needs of our children so that they are able to learn. Safety is important to all of us. We've enhanced our safety procedures and protocols here in Baltimore County Public Schools by releasing a comprehensive safety plan that provides guidance to our staff and students as well as other stakeholders in creating and maintaining safe and secure learning environments. We have also implemented the ALICE Active Assailant Response Protocol. ALICE stands for Alert, Lockdown, Inform, Counter, and Evacuate. This is an options-based approach that required the training of over 300 certified instructors. So the benefit of ALICE training for students and I think also for the administration is that it makes a hypothetical situation a lot more manageable um, and it makes us feel a lot more prepared and in control of in case that were to happen. Um, and I also think that it's just really reassuring to know that our school and our county is doing something to prepare us. BCPS has also expanded the School Resource Officer Program in partnership with the Baltimore County Police Department. In addition to having school resource officers in all secondary schools, we now have SROs serving our elementary schools. It gives them the benefit of seeing someone every day that's going to have their best interests at heart. The other aspect of being an SRO in the elementary school is the safety aspect. Uh, it's worked in high school is worked in middle school, and it's going to work in elementary school. Myself and my other counterparts, we have the same goals in mind, and that's provide a safe environment for our kids to learn, and that's what we take to heart every day. Student safety is critical to meeting students' social and emotional needs. 
SEL, also known as social emotional learning, is a process for helping children to develop fundamental skills for success in life. These skills include recognizing and managing our emotions, developing care and concern for others, establishing positive relationships, responsible decision making, and managing challenging situations. At BCPS, our main focus on the whole child to be competent and confident in the use of SEL skills is promoted in the context of safe and supportive learning communities in which children feel respected, valued, connected, and engaged in learning. Mr. Chair, that is my report. Thank you. All right, it's uh, item G on the agenda, the Chair's report. Um, and I have a few comments. As the board readies for a new chapter with many new members starting on December 3rd, 2018, the opportunities uh, for uh, us to comment on the state of Baltimore County Public Schools are short uh, and uh, for many of us around this dais. Uh, for this reason, I use this opportunity to make a few observations from the chair's perspective. Number one, uh, the community, this community, is very, very fortunate to have Relita White at the helm of Baltimore County Public Schools. Uh, Mrs. White's passion for public education is palpable. Uh, her intimate knowledge of our county can only come from uh, one who uh, actually went to school here and from one who has dedicated the bulk of her professional career here. Uh, similarly, uh, Mrs. White's relationship with our teachers is strong because it is built upon her love of teaching and her ability to say, I have been there. Uh, so from this vantage, I sure hope that Mrs. White will remain our superintendent for many, many years to come. Two, Baltimore County government is a great supporter of public education. And I take this opportunity right now to congratulate our county executive elect, Johnny Osheski Jr. Uh, and wish him the best of luck in the years to come. And I also want to thank County Executive Don Moeller, who for his lifetime has had a commitment to public education in Baltimore County. Strong communities are built upon strong public schools. Strong schools are achieved by building up and not by tearing down. Everyone, citizens, students, parents, board members, I must focus on building up and not on tearing down. The negative energy expended in tearing down, in creating, fostering, or festering discontent or dissatisfaction, instead of building on all of the good in our Baltimore County public school system, does great harm to our entire community. We all need to be champions of public education, and we need to ensure that efforts are focused on providing our children the foundations they need to survive and succeed in this 21st century environment. Equity for all, equity for all 115,000 students is essential. Third, I'm pleased to have had the opportunity to serve on this board for almost five and a half years. I've met and worked with an exceptionally talented team that this board has tasked with running the 25th largest school system in our country. Make no mistake, a leadership team as talented and as competent and as committed to education uh, and to educate in our 115,000 students, 115,000 students, doesn't just happen and cannot be replicated with the snap of one's fingers. So I thank this extraordinary team and also thank our over 9,000 teachers who deliver educational content uh, each and every day. Four, finally, I, uh, and that is I finally um, on this list congratulate the seven persons elected to um, this school board uh, at the election this past Tuesday. Um, I wish all of them uh, the best as uh, the future of public education in Baltimore County will be in your hands. Um, Mrs. White listed them. I'd like to list them again and congratulate them for um, their commitment and their willingness to both run in a campaign and to serve on this school board for the next four years. Lisa Mack, Cheryl Pasteur, Kathleen Causey, Makita Scott, Julie Henn, Lily Rowe, and Rod McMillian. Thank all of you.
All right, the only thing between me and Miss Adekoya is saying, Miss Adekoya, it's your turn. Good evening, everyone, and happy Thursday. I truly hope that on Tuesday, many of you registered voters got out and expressed your right and superpower in casting your ballot. Congratulations to the newly elected Board of Education for Baltimore County. I am confident that with your dedication and passion to better the children of BCPS, we shall continue to strive for excellence and change, continuing to create an impactful educational path for our children. And I would love to say a big thank you to the current board for all your hard work, effort, and commitment to the success of BCPS students. I cannot believe that the first quarter ends tomorrow already. I hope that everyone has been able to put their best foot forward to excel this first quarter. Don't forget to always seek that extra help if you need it in any area. If you have yet to join a club, look around for what interests you, and as well, if you can't find one, just join it, or just create it, sorry. Just create it, you have that power. Again, students, as a student member, I am here for you. I have been working alongside food and nutrition, transportation services, to figure out what we are doing well as a system and what can be done better. Whether it's less pizza, vegetarian options, replacing styrofoam with an alternative option, or getting to school on time, or that you love your bus members, bus teachers. Your input are duly noted and we are continuously discovering ways to enhance your dining and commuting experiences. Our conversations about the lack of attention and ineffective solutions to our mental health continues to be a prevalent topic within the student body. Students, our mental health is the most pivotal part of our ability to function. We deserve to be in an adequate environment that fuel healthy mindsets as well as be surrounded by people that sustain it. From the discussions I've had with many of you, you have made me to understand that you wish your counselors and teachers were more than ad academic enrichment personnel, but also support staff who consider your holistic being. Where they create safe environments to provide you with the ability to vent, but also provide resources needed to overcome whatever mental battle you are facing. I've also heard your cry to be made aware of resources available to you in your school, such as school psychologists and social workers. I believe that with the continuance of the magnifying of our voices on this topic, we will be able to draw further attention to what solutions and tactics can be set in place for better help and resources. Team BCPS, we do great as it is, and I am confident that we can continue to do better. As the school year progresses, please do not continue, please do not hesitate to continue to keep me in the loop regarding your needs, wants, and concerns as students. Do not hesitate to continue to contact me or invite me to your school events. Good luck in the second quarter, and congratulations to all the seniors who received acceptances as the second annual BCPS HBCU College and Career Fair hosted today at Milford Mill Academy. More success to you. Thank you. Thank you. Next on our agenda is item I, and that is board policies, and I invite our policy review committee chair, Mr. Virch, to proceed. Uh, thank you, Ed. Um, Mr. Chair and members of our board, our Board of Education's Policy Review Committee asks that our board accept this report of your committee's recommendation to amend the following policies. Board Policy 6304, Commemorations and Observances, Board Policy 67, 6307, Patriotic Exercises, Board Policy 6500, Research and Assessment, Board Policy 7240, School Site Selection and Acquisition. I note at your seats and in board docs is a copy of policy 6304. The copy provided to you previously did not uh, include changes recommended by the policy review committee at its September meeting. The policy before you reflects the change recommended by the policy review committee on September 17th, 2018 to amend further the policy to include Patriot Day to the list of school system commemorations and observances. The proposed amended policies are presented to you on tonight's board agenda as Exhibit I. Um, your committee considered public comments received during the board's public meetings on July 10th, 2018 and September 11th, 2018. Thank you, Mr. Virch. Do I have a motion to adopt the recommendations of the board's policy review committee? So moved. Mr. Chair, could we split those up and, and uh address one at a time sure there's been a motion to accept them all but i'll take them one at a time there's no need for a second on all any of them because this came from the committee first uh there's been a motion to accept uh board policy 6304 commemorations and observances any discussion mrs miller thank you um, and I'll just make my comments regarding both um policy 6304 and 6307 um 
I believe that, uh, and I don't remember the exact timing of it, but since the start of the process uh, in revising those two policies, that, that's patriotic exercises and commemorative days, I believe there was an issue uh, raised regarding student protest. And uh, in reviewing these policies for third reader, I believe that we should probably address that issue and make some clarifications in our policy to address that. So my recommendation would be to send those two policies back to consider that language. All right, there's, uh, I'll accept that as a motion to amend, to, to send policy 6304 and 6307 back to the PRC. Is there a second on that motion to amend? Motion fails for lack of a second. All right. So we're going to do these one at a time. The motion is to accept board policy 6304. All in favor, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, 11. The motion passes. Next is board policy 6307. All in favor of accepting the recommendations of the PRC, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, 11. Next is board policy 6500. All in favor, please raise your hand. I had some uh, comments on that one. All right, Mrs. Miller, comments on 6500. Yes, this one is on um, assessment, and I believe on this one, the policy should also um, address over testing and the amount of time uh, during the school year that can be allotted to testing per student. We've had a lot of input regarding that, not only just the stress, the um, connectivity issues, the, um, you know, a lot of issues around getting the tests accomplished, but also the uh, loss of instruction during those testing times. So um, I think this would be the correct policy to address those issues as well. So my recommendation is to send this one back to PRC. I think I'll accept that as a Motion to amend the motion to approve 6500. Is there a second to the motion to return this to the PRC? Hearing none, that motion to amend fails. The motion is Mrs. Causey. I just wanted to make a comment that um, I um, agree with Ms. Miller in that it's important that we do not lose instructional time to excessive testing and that there is um, new. Um, focus on this with MSDE in eliminating the park testing and coming up with an alternative. So I am optimistic that we will return to um, what we had previously where it's going to be less intrusive because I do believe that the park tests were very intrusive in terms of instruction time and not just when the student's actually taking the test, but in the rearrangement of the school day needed to accommodate testing certain students at certain times. So I'm optimistic that things will get better, um, but at the same time that I do believe that this policy can be passed as it stands. Any further comments? All in favor of the PRC recommendation regarding 6500, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, 11. That motion passes as well. And the last one is board policy 7240. All in favor of it, please raise your hand. One, two, and that's unanimous. Thank you, Mr. Birch. You Next. are most welcome, Mr. Chair. Next on our agenda is item J, proposed 2019-2020 school year calendar. Um, I think Mr. May Dr. Mayo and Mr. Duke are uh, here, um, and I believe, do you have a presentation or? All right. Do I have a motion to approve the proposed 2019-2020 school calendar? How about a second? Any discussion? Mrs. Causey. So I just want to clarify that this calendar does not include the 15 minutes per day extension. That's, that's correct. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Mrs. Causey. So I'm going to be voting against this calendar. I mean, and the issue is it's inadequate as it stands. Uh, the new board is going to have to take up the issue of extending 15 minutes per day. I believe that this has been delayed unnecessarily. We started talking about extending the school day over a year ago. 
and um, so the new board's going to have to revisit it in any case. So I'm going to be voting against it because it's inadequate on its face. Um, and I look forward to working with the new board around providing our teachers and students uh, equitable instruction time as other districts in the state of Maryland. Any further discussion? All right, all in favor? Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Adekoya. I'm not sure if this can be gauged, but my question is just that, is this calendar a right representation of fairness for students regarding like religion? Yes, this, yes that it matters. is. That's all that matters, thank you. All right, all in favor of the motion to approve the proposed 2019-2020 school calendar, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six. The motion fails. Um, all right, next is personnel matters. All right. And for that, we invite Dr. Mayo. Right. Good evening again. Um, my board consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, leaves of absence, ethics review panel appointment, deceased recognition of service, and certificated appointments. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters presented in exhibits K1 through K6? All right, do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? Mrs. Miller. I'm going to be abstaining on certificated appointments. All right, any further discussion? All in favor of the motion, uh, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. The motion carries. Abstain? I'm abstaining, thank you. And there's two abstentions, Mrs. Causey and Mrs. Miller. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mayo. Mr. Chair? Mrs. Miller. While we have Dr. Mayo, I have a few um, questions around HR. Could I ask some quest general questions? Uh, so, uh, yes, uh, I, depending on what they are. So let's go. Okay. All right. I wanted to see if, um, ask first if HR ever conducts any studies um, to look at how well we attract talented staff and retain staff. Well, we, we look at information as far as um, information from the exit, exit data, um, survey data, um, also just sometimes stay interviews as far as people who are actually here with us still. Um, find out why they like to stay with Baltimore County. We work closely with the Division of Organizational Development as well um, to provide professional development opportunities uh, based upon information we are receiving from employees. Um, so we look at that information. We also, when we are looking at um, trying to diversify our workforce, we're also looking at uh, various websites, uh, looking at areas that we actually go to recruit to see if it's actually the best bang for our buck. Um, are we uh, seeing a return on our investment as far as our students from various universities staying with us over a period of time? So yes, we do a lot of different things to, to try to keep employees around. Um, nationwide, zero to five years is pretty hard to keep employees, uh, teachers that is. Um, so what we have is pretty unique here in Baltimore County of having the consulting teacher in place. So anyone who's new to teacher, teaching, receives a consulting teacher who also works with them more or less like as, as a coach working with them to kind of guide them to make sure they can stay with us. Um, in a perfect world, we would love to keep that person, a consulting teacher with a first year teacher beyond year one. Um, since the trends nationwide, zero to five years you, is when you usually lose a lot of your teachers. So yes, we're doing different things. We use various websites to find out where we, sh where we should go far as for our recruitment activities. Currently, we recruited over 80 different schools and centers um, throughout the year, so it's an ongoing um, process that takes place throughout the school year. Um, our peak hiring season time period is probably, um, say, February until August, uh, but we take maybe the month of September off before we start back up in the month of October. Um, so right now we're looking at attracting December graduates for any uh, vacancies we may have and also just for looking at individuals that would like to come and be a part of Team BCPS for the 2019-2020 school year as well. Very good, thank you. Um, HR maintains a lot of records. There's, there's been a lot of talk about records right now, uh, especially as the central office is, is continually expanding. Has there been any move to store records electronically instead of warehousing? We have not had that conversation. Okay. Um, the um, chief communications officer position, that's been vacant for over a year. Has that position been posted? No, it has not. Okay. Um, and and it has not been eliminated, I assume. 
It's still in the budget. Okay. Uh, but I see that uh, we are currently posting for an executive assistant for this vacant position. Is that correct? Yes, it's on the website to provide support to the Office of Communications. Okay. Um, and how many years of HR experience is required for uh, our HR central office staff to have? Are there requirements? I don't have the job descriptions in front of me far as for the different positions. We have several positions in human resources. Mrs. Miller, let's, uh, let's add those questions in writing and we'll get Dr. Mayo to do it kind of offline so it's not taken away from our agenda tonight. Um, but I appreciate the questions that you've asked. Okay, and can we post um, answers to that? Oh well, yeah, sure. Okay. All, All right. right, next Thank on our agenda is administrative appointments, okay. and for that I call Mrs. White. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Chairman Gillis, and members of the board. I would like to bring forward for your approval the following administrative appointments. Principal, General John Stricker Middle School, Executive Director, Department of Information Technology, and Supervisor, Office of Special Education, Teaching and Learning. All right, do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit L1? Is there a second? Okay. Discussion? All in favor, please raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I'm Opposed? abstaining. Abstain. I'm two abstaining. abstentions. The motion carries. Um, Mrs. White. Okay, I'd like to congratulate the following personnel. When you hear your name, please stand along with your friends and family if you'd like so that we can recognize and celebrate you. First on our list, we have Jim Corns, who will be the new Executive Director, Department of Information Technology. <laughs> Congratulations, Jim. Do you have anyone here with you tonight? Congratulations. <laughs> We'd also like to recognize Kenya Golden, who will be the new supervisor in the Office of Special Education, Teaching and Learning. <laughs> Congratulations, Kenya. Do you have anyone here with you tonight? Very good. Congrats. We'd also like to recognize Laurie Phillips, who will be the new principal of General John Stricker Middle School. <laughs> Congratulations, Laurie. Do you have anyone here with you tonight? I have my husband Adam here with me, and also my former, I guess, principal Brian. <laughs> Very good. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Very good. Next on our agenda is item M, and it's a consideration of action taken in closed session, but I don't believe we had any action taken in closed session, so I'm going to, unless somebody corrects me, I'm going to move to item N, uh, which is um, new business, a petition for declaratory ruling. Is there a motion to um, direct uh, counsel to file the petition for declaratory ruling? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? I'll, I'll speak to the motion. Please. So, board members, as we know, we have before us a petition for a declaratory ruling that would be filed with the State Board of Education requesting clarification on the application of the applicable um, laws and regulations relating to the appointment of a local superintendent. Uh, speaking for me, at least I think that this is critically important. This is our primary function as a board and we need to understand uh, whether and to what degree we have discretion to affect our own choice for our own local superintendent for the kids that we serve and that um, seven of us will now be elected to serve. So I think that this speaks to um, a level setting for many years to come of critical importance in order for us to be able to understand again what role do we play in this primary most important function that we have as a board that has been, in my opinion, stymied by an improper application of the law by the state superintendent. Further discussion? Mrs. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I don't have any issue with uh, the board asking for a um, clarification of COMAR. I think uh, that makes sense if there's uh, any questions around that. Uh, however, in our petition, I, I do object to um, the language throughout that actually um, 
asks for a certain outcome, and it's an outcome that I don't believe uh, that, that I couldn't uh, vote to support. So for that reason, I'm going to be voting against the petition. Thank you. Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to say that I think it's an ineffective use of our system resources. We have a lot of critical needs, a lot of critical issues that we need to work on, um, and I think it's just an ineffective use of our resources. If there's actually a question or a clarification, that certainly could be asked. And if it's an issue statewide, as was indicated, of, of uh, clarifying it, it could be handled by the MABE, our Maryland Association Boards of Education, for a statewide issue. So I'll be voting no. Mr. Stewart. To respond to that point, uh, it is uh, just stunning to me to hear a board member on this local Board of Education to suggest that clarifying in this time our ability to exercise, again, our most important role is a waste of system resources in a $1.6, $1.5 billion budget to not have the needed clarity that we have, that we have suffered through um, for the last year or so uh, is remarkable, truly remarkable. And I think that, again, um, understanding and certainly asking the State Board whether or not we have the primary authority to make this decision and that the state superintendent's authority is limited to ensuring that the statutory minimum provisions are satisfied. To better understand that, I can't depict or envision a more important clarification for this board going forward to have. It is our obligation to discuss, to caucus, and to put in place that person who we believe is going to lead this system and its 115,000 kids into a better future. Th this is it. This is what it comes down to. Mrs. Causey. I would just like to say it, there's a difference between asking for clarification and, as Ms. Miller pointed out, asking for a result. So you and I can just respectfully agree to disagree. Mrs. Miller. Uh, I, I think that this board considered or spent less time actually considering candidates for the position of superintendent than it is in considering this petition. All right. The motion is to direct the council to file the petition for declaratory ruling. All in favor, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And opposed? One, two, three, four. The motion carries. All right, next on our agenda is um, item O, privately funded capital project. And let's see, Mr. Roberts, oh, and Ms. Byers. So good evening, good evening Chair Gillis, Vice Chair Stewart, Superintendent White, and members of the board. Tonight I bring forward for your approval a privately funded capital improvement project for the purchase and installation of benches on the primary and intermediate playgrounds of Essex Elementary School. <laughs> <laughs> these, these benches are <laughs> these benches are being we, we can go from there. <laughs> So the, keep going. So these benches are just a, two more sentences, Mr. Verse. These benches are being installed on existing concrete pads. The project is being funded entirely by the Essex PTSA, in line with our BCPS policy and Rule 7330. In accordance with this policy, the request has progressed through all normal channels. And this evening, we have supporting the effort Principal Brooke Wagner, PTA President Candy Dean, PTA Vice President Sarah Kyle, and PTA Secretary Angel. Hyatt. <laughs> All right, so there's a motion by Mr. Virch. Is there a second? second? Any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. <laughs> it is 12 to nothing. Good work. <laughs> okay, and good evening. I'm bringing forward for approval a privately funded capital improvement project to purchase and install for new adjustable glass backboards on the sides of the gymnasium at Pikesville Middle School. Uh, with us tonight on behalf of the administrative staff from Pikesville Middle and supporting this is Assistant <coughs> Principal Ms. Shella Lachtefeld. Thank you for being here. This project is being fully funded by the Greater Pikesville Recreation Council and most incorporated will be the installer of this new equipment. In accordance with policy and rule 7330, this request has progressed through all of our normal internal processes for review. Oh, no. oh, he wasn't. All right, is there a motion? <laughs> 
Second. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. Another unanimous decision with Mr. Virch's vote in the back. Uh, thank you both. I think that uh, there was an, a uh, closed session matter that was separate from the ones that Dr. Mayo presented, and it was rehired, retired. Was that a separate item? It should have been with the appointments, but it wasn't listed in the agenda. Um, so I want to um, ask for there to be a motion to uh, accept the rehired, retired item. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hands. Very good. Thank you. Do you want to speak to that? Yes. Is Ms. Vore here? Sue Vore. I just would like to congratulate Sue Vore, who was be returning to Baltimore County Public Schools, the new director of mathematics. So let's congratulate her. <laughs> All right. Now we're on to item P, contract awards, and I call on Mr. Stewart. Good evening. So earlier this evening, the Building and Contracts Committee met to consider items P1 through three, uh, P10. Uh, we recommended uh, via unanimous vote that the full board uh, vote to approve these items. Do I have a motion to approve items P1 through P10? Any discussion? Mr. Chair, can we take them individually? We can. And we will. There's a motion to accept them all, and there's no need for a second. So the first item is... Um, Community College of Baltimore County College and Career Readiness Memorandum of Understanding. Any discussion? Mrs. Miller. Yes, thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask what the $6 million pays for. We'll invite Mr. Saris to come forward. And Doc, uh, Mr. Saris, as you, if you require anyone else, just please invite them to come forward as well. Okay. Did you say, what was the number you quoted? I think it said it was $6 million. Yes. There. So uh, that covers the tuition and fees uh, f as appropriate for the eight uh, different programs that we've itemized here. The, um, there's a, a breakout of the annual funding for the Pathways in Technology program. The other uh, seven programs collectively uh, cost $634,000 last year, and we've uh, projected them uh, at about that amount, $635,000 a year for the next five years of this program, which gets us around that $6.2 million number. And how many BCPS students take advantage of those programs? The uh, most recent enrollment is uh, just under 3,000, and I don't believe we have it by program uh, unless, um, yeah, I don't think we have. Do you have a uh, cost per student? Um, it varies uh, because uh, some students are qualified for the full tuition and fees, and some are eligible to be uh, at 50 per We only pay 50 percent of the tuition in that case. And um, I think Dr. Wistead would have Doctor. to provide any additional. So what's the question? <laughs> Do you have a cost per student? So is it on two different two scales? Right. So there's... There's multiple programs, so depending on the program that the student's participating in, it would be a different cost. So, for instance, our largest um, spending is the tuition-free program. So that allows students to take up to four classes at CCBC at 50% of the cost. CCBC only charges us 50%, um, and we cover that cost. Uh, but not every child takes four classes. And so what is the cost per student on that one? Is the question wh how much is a there course? A, is there a per credit cost? I mean, it's tuition and fees. Is there any other 
administrative costs rolled well, into that? Um, the, the fees are only for the student if they don't qualify for free and reduced meal. Okay. And um, I want to make note that the board has not been provided. The, the student has to pay the fee and for their own books. We don't pay that. Okay. Uh, the board has not been provided with a copy of the MOU. Is that something that we can uh, have sent forward to the, to the board? At the request of the superintendent, of, yes. Okay, further discussion on. I'm sorry, uh, what was the answer to that? As, as directed by the, the superintendent, superintendent, yes. Yes. Okay, so I'm requesting that we get a copy I'll of the MOU. I'll take a look at that. I'll consult with our legal team in terms of um, the sharing of that. All right, further discussion on P1. All in favor of P1, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, 11. Opposed? One, Mrs. Miller. Okay, next is contract two, JNI 72315, board certified behavior analyst. Are there questions or comments? All in favor of P2, please raise your hand. It's 12, that passes. Next is contract P3, JMI 61019, public notice e-book library resources for K-12 learners. Are there questions or comments about it? All in, seeing none, all in favor of P3, um, yeah, P3, please raise your hands. That is 12 to nothing, that passes. Next is four, uh, JNI 76116, modification meeting space. Discussion or comments about it? Mrs. Miller. I had a couple of questions on that. Um, what types of meetings are taking place at hotels? Uh, oftentimes, primarily professional development where there's a large enough space to accommodate several hundred teachers or administrators uh, who spend a half day or a full day uh, in training. Okay. And so. It we're only using this kind of meeting space when it's a large group. It's not something that could be accommodated in any of our schools that are, say, under capacity, might have space. Um, typically, uh, we will use all of this, the available auditorium or school space uh, that's available without disrupting the educational program and only if that's not available, then we would seek out the most affordable option between the uh, uh, vendors that we have presented here. Mr. Saris, in fact, even this room is used when it's not used by the board, correct? Absolutely, every day, it's booked. Further Ed, questions? Ed? Mr. George, Birch. George, do we rent this room out too? No, we have <laughs> not done that. Uh, we, some On weekends, some public groups do pay a small fee to use school space when it's available. Further questions on uh, contract P4? All in favor of contract P4, please raise your hands. All right, that's 12 to nothing. Next is P5, JNI 736-15, modification private duty and substitute nurses. Questions or comments about it? All in favor of oh, Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to point out that this is a very important contract in supporting our most fragile students. Um, it does seem that we are having increasing needs, so I support the uh, increasing uh, modification amount. Um, some of the students that are affected by it are those that with, with autism. Um, so I'm very glad to see this contract come forward. All right, all in favor of contract P5, please raise your hands. That is 12 to nothing as well. Next is P6, JMI 611-16, modification land, mobile radio systems, and associated equipment. Are there questions or comments about it? Mrs. Miller. What is public safety radio access? That would be the ability of the radio user to connect with the county's 911 system for police, fire, or medical emergencies. What have they got in place right now? Uh, we Well, all schools have uh, land mobile radios. Um, 
but uh, they're not linked, I don't believe. I'll have to ask Mr. Vukov if they're linked in with the 911. Come on forward and sit down. Currently, the radios are not because they're analog radios, and the county has gone over to a digital system. So this will allow us to go ahead and do the upgrades and be able to be compatible with county systems in the future. And this will be in every classroom? No, not right away. Um, right away, we're looking at the administrative offices and buses. Um, but in the future, we are piloting the use of radios within classrooms. So we do have it in three schools that we are looking at right now <coughs> to see what the impacts will be. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Further questions? All right, all in favor of P6, please raise your hand. 12 to nothing, thank you. Next is P7, LKO 409-19, screen reading software. Any questions about it? Mrs. Miller. What is this for? Uh, it's an assistive technology that uh, will vocalize text for special education students and also uh, it will be used on the website to make it uh, accessible to those with certain disabilities. Okay, so it's for student use. Students and the public access to the website. So if if you scroll over a particular uh, feature on the website, it will give you a a spoken label as to what is in that spot. And how many devices does this purchase for the students? Uh, we're purchasing a number of licenses. Let me see here. I believe we currently purchase about 35 licenses, and I don't know if um, Mrs. Embriali can add to that. While she's coming up, how long do you think that this um, software will be current before it becomes obsolete? Well, it is one of our shorter contracts at two years and four months, but I don't have the technical answer to that question. Mrs. Embriali. Good evening. Um, so the software is approximately um, $1,000 per license. All right, thank you very much. All right, any further questions or comments on P7? All in favor, please raise your hands. 12 to nothing. Next is P8, MBU 521-16 modification. Ready for this? Ice cream. Questions about ice cream? All right, all in favor of, all in favor of P8, that's in, being in favor of ice cream. Or do you have a comment about ice cream? Oh, all in favor of ice cream, please raise your hands. All right, it's unanimous. Uh, next is P9, MBU 501-19, Vehicle Service and Repairs. Are there questions or comments? All in favor of it, please raise your hands. It is 12 to nothing. And the last one is P10, MWE 801-19, Temporary Construction Easement at Kearney Elementary School. Is there discussion about it? All in favor, please raise your hands. And it too is unanimous, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Saris. Thank you. All right, next on our agenda is item Q, follow up to transportation update. And I believe that Mr. Smith is coming forward. And Mr. Chair, while uh, Mr. Smith and Mr. McCray are coming forward, I just would like to uh, thank the team for providing information, not only to the board that the board received in your weekly update, last week but also to the public these uh, responses are have been posted online for the public um, in terms of the some of the frequently asked questions that we've received so with that i'll turn it over to the team smith chairman gillis vice chair stewart superintendent white members of the board i am joined my name is kevin smith and i'm joined by david mccray our director of Transpa transportation um, as miss white indicated this is a follow-up discussion to questions that were provided by the presented by the board for follow-up discussions on um, matters related to transportation. Um, 
I'll just give you an overview of um, how the year has gone thus far. Certainly, uh, you have gotten questions related to transportation concerns, and um, we are working, working tirelessly with every one of those issues as we would do each and every year as they persist. What I would ask as we move through this process is that the sooner that we can get it to our transportation folks, the quicker we can get resolution. So I know that um, messages certainly come to the board and you know, that's fine and we continue to do that. But as soon as we get them, we can certainly address them as we go forward. First, I'd like to say that um, I want to thank all of the many drivers and routing assistants and uh, attendants on all of our buses and all of our transportation staff that run the gamut from our fleet folks that you've spoken with earlier doing building the contracts, um, all of the many people that make this very large transportation system work. Um, certainly, I would love to have a system that had was error free but that's not really the world we live in. Um, as we talk about issues re related to um, buses being late and things of that nature, I would ask that you keep in mind that um, there are a lot of vehicles that um, maneuver on our st streets each and every day, um, and we too have buses that do those same routes, um, that experience trees falling, that experience um, certain animals being hit and accidents, and unfortunately, the dreaded beltway. And we all experience that and we, we uh, certainly are uh, appreciative of what our drivers do every day to make that ride for our students as safe as possible and to be, to be that warm and inviting face for students as they start their day. They're the first faces they see in the morning and the last a lot of times in the evening. And so I just want to thank our drivers and our attendants for the hard work that they, that they do every day. And I think and I know that they strive every day to do this with absolutely no disruptions, but those things happen. I am not making excuses, I'm just saying it happens. So I would like that as we go through this, you would um, bear in mind that there are a host of things that slow us down when we're doing this thing, these, these operations. Um, I won't belabor this any longer because I have Mr. McCray here who will go through those um, those l l major themes that were presented and the questions that were provided by board members. With that, I'll turn it over to Mr. McRae, who will go through those, and then at that point in time, we'll be available for any questions you may have. Um, good evening, good evening. Um, Madam Chair. Uh, sorry, Mr. Chair, <laughs> Madam <laughs> Superintendent. Uh, good start. Um, and uh, um, can I give my congratulations to those on the board that will re return, um, and obviously new members that are with us um, this evening as well. Um, and to those of you that won't join us um, again, um, it's been a real pleasure working with you. And, um, I, I, as Kevin's already mentioned, uh, um, the sort of gamut of the team, and we actually, with us this evening, we have pretty much a, almost a full range of the team from supervisory level staff to our maintenance staff, drivers, attendants, um, we have routing assistants, and um, uh, field reps, which are, are, are sort of mid-level managers. Um, uh, many of them are here. I'm just so that we can recognize absolutely everybody that's here from the team. I'd like to ask them for just one moment to stand up. Um, as, as Kevin said, I do want to go through the, the points that were um, a, a given to us as questions. Um, and the first of, uh, of those was bus capacity. Um, uh, all the buses that uh, we uh, uh, purchase in, in, uh, in our system are uh, given a, a manufacturer's uh, rating, uh, a capacity rating, um, and, and that's um, what we uh, abide by. Um, uh, and, and we also have uh, goals for those. So for our, uh, our elementary uh, level students, um, we uh, go to no more than three per seat is our goal. And for our uh, secondary level students, um, we are, our goal is two per seat. Um, where we have any report of uh, a, any overcrowding of that, um, we take that information, um, that can come from the drivers themselves, 
Uh, it can come from school staff, it can come from families, students, and uh, we uh, seek to address those on each individual um, case that, that we get. Um, and I know we, we heard of an individual case this evening, and I'll be happy to, to look at that individual case uh, and, and, and take that. We regularly have uh, done seat counts on um, any kind of scenario that gets brought to us, and, and we'll happily do that um, moving forwards. Um, driver recruitment and retention. Um, uh, we are continually working with our, our friends in the Office of Staffing, um, and we have monthly, if not more regularly, recruitment events, um, and again, monthly driver and attendant training courses. Our most recent uh, recruitment event was on October 30th. There is another on uh, November 21st and another on December 17th. So we see recruitment in the Office of Transportation as a year-round activity and uh, an opportunity for us, and the same um, for driver and attendant training classes that we run as well. Um, one, the, one of the next uh, topics we were asked to, to speak about was about uh, student assignments. Um, our student information system and our uh, electronic writing system are continually uh, passing information between each other. Um, at the beginning of the school year, obviously we have a, a, a massive amount of enrolment going on and it, it, all the way up until the beginning of school and beyond. Um, so when we give those, we have to give our our routes, our initial routes to the schools. Um, we did this year for general education on the 4th of August. So as students are still enrolling, that, that when the routes are given out to the school, they're not necessarily uh, do we have every student in, uh, assigned to a bus. So the systems catch up with each other. They're talking each, each night. And uh, if a student is uh, enrolled in a school, um, that information will come through to Route Finder Pro um, uh, and that student should be assigned at this stage now just about the next day. Um, if it's an existing stop, they'll just be assigned immediately to that stop. If it's more than that, then um, we'll work with the school to do so. Um, so our, our, our students are really being assigned to buses on a kind of day-by-day -day basis now. Um, driver training, um, we, we've taken in many factors. Um, training in our, in our hiring process um, uh, at recruitment. Um, our, our first stage is going through the HR clearance um, for, as for any uh, new employee. And uh, once that clearance is given to us and the dry, uh, the staff have passed their employment physical and for a driver, a, a Department of Transportation physical, they'll come to us for pre-service training. Um, there's behind the wheel if it's a driver as well. And once all of that uh, training and examination is completed, then the, the driver um, or attendant will, will then become a fully fledged uh, employee and uh, come onto the road uh, and on the bus with us. Ongoing training, if we have to do uh, uh, any form of uh, retraining, um, for example, after a first preventable accident within two years, um, an em employee would be required to go to a retraining course with our trainers. Um, we have ongoing training, which is mandated by Comar in our in-service training as well. Um, communication. Um, with our school administrators and families. Um, we've, we've held summer meetings with all our school administrators. Um, three of these took place um, prior to the start of the school year. Um, our communications centre um, in the uh, Office of Transportation, um, with the help of our, our friends in uh, IT, became a true call centre this year. Um, so that we can now take a, a much larger volume of calls and have any number of operators signing in and out of the system, um, which is much more efficient, and we can take uh, and answer a higher number and a higher volume of calls. We also have um, BP BCPS serve system, which will generate um, 
call um, tickets from those calls so that they can be assigned to staff to take them to take them on and see through to completion. Um, we've also really enhanced our communication with the community superintendent's offices, so we're working together with them to get our communication out to schools. So um, if we have an incident, we're notifying community superintendent's offices as well as the schools um, to get information out there. Um, Our routing system, which uh, has been mentioned earlier, um, I do want to emphasize that our, our routing system is a tool um, and that our routing system um, assists us in creation of our, our school bus routes. They're done very much in conjunction. Mr. McRae, I'm just going to I'm just going to translate sure. that's routing. Routing. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Yes. Uh, our routing system. Yes. I have a Apparently, I have an accent, <laughs> um, and that electronic routing system is a is a tool which takes our student populations and where they are um, within any given location and pulls them towards stops. Um, those routes are all absolutely approved by our routing assistant teams and what I call boots on the ground, um, and our senior operations supervisors. So the. The computer itself does not generate our routes. It, give, it is a tool to assist us to generate those routes. And just as importantly, it's also um, taking our, our um, management of student information. Um, and, and I'll give you an example of just this very week where um, when we had the terrible news that uh, some of our, our students had uh, become displaced due to uh, some buildings that were damaged in the Dundalk area. On Saturday morning, my colleagues in school safety contacted me. Can we identify who those students may be very quickly? Route Finder Pro told us by bus stop exactly um, a list of students that could be affected. We were able to get that to our PPWs, our principals, and our Office of School Safety within the hour. Um, and, and that was what I called at that point, that was data first responding. Um, so it's not just about the geography and uh, creating um, the bus routes, very important to us uh, in other ways as well. Um, our automated vehicle location system that we've been utilising um, now for um, last school year and, and the first part of this school year has really helped us um, in determining uh, timings of our routes. Um, as, as well as working um, in conjunction with the um, electronic writing system. Um, it also helps us to work with our, our friends in uh, special education when we are looking to determine exactly what a ridership, uh, sorry, a, a ride time is for a student. It gives us from when it stops at a particular location to when it drops at another location. So when we're really looking at ride times for our special needs students, we can do that with accuracy and i quote Kevin with fidelity, um, and, and really verify that information. Um, so we've been uh, uh, really making advanced steps uh, uh, where that's concerned too, and the information that we would, that w we get into our call center, um, uh, we're able to say, yep, that, that bus is five minutes away, or it is uh, on a particular uh, street, which is very close to the location that the caller may be asking about, and the bus is mere moments away. So we're really able to give um, live and real-time information on some of that. Um, so um, I, I know that uh, the, the board wish to Thanks. ask questions, so, right. so um, with that I'll so, pass over. So I will ask the board for questions, and I will just remind you, Mr. McRae, as well as board members, that we're not talking about individual or specific persons or personnel. Mm -hmm. um, Mrs. Hen. Thank you, Mr. Dillis. Good evening, Mr. McCray. Good evening. Um, overall, can you tell us what is our planned ridership as a percentage of available capacity? Meaning, if we look at the total number of planned riders versus our total capacity, mm -hmm. looking for a percentage of that to identify. Mrs. Hen, is your mic on? Just, I don't think so. Sorry about that. Yeah. I'll repeat my question. Overall, what is our planned ridership as a percentage of available capacity? 
that's a, a calculation that we would need Fall to apart. So uh, we have eligible we have eligible students, which is uh, what we have is 84, 81,000 eligible students at our most recent uh, count. So I'd need to. Um, we don't have a, a, a sort of electronic ridership count that I could give you today. So we complete what's called time and mileage. Um, and so when the next time and mileage is complete, that's when we would be able to know what ridership um, is looking like. But certainly this would be a key metric we're looking at to gauge do we have adequate capacity for our planned ridership. The last time I saw the numbers, our planned ridership far exceeded our available capacity. And that's planned. That doesn't account for the last minute registrations, those coming into the system, kids riding the buses that are not planned. So, so my question is, are we planning to exceed our given capacity, thinking that some students will get frustrated and you know rely on parent transportation or may end up not riding our buses for whatever reason or are we actually meeting our capacity goals as you stated three to a seat for elementary two to a seat for secondary what so, is our capacity and do we have adequate capacity so our eligible riders is not our actual ridership so when we have that doesn't that's not a uh, I understand. We, we, we I'm asking about planned ridership. When we're forecasting our needs what, for that, adequate seats that, for our that's students. That's based on eligible riders. So we, we, we take the 80, 81,000 or so riders that we have um, in, the, in the system that may be eligible to ride. The, that's what we plan for. S certainly, we know that that may be less than that because not everyone is going to ride a bus for a host of reasons. Uh, parents take them or whatever the case. But the 81,000 is what we plan for. And that's how we uh, allocate our drivers and our routes based on that plan. That, that is an adjustable number as we get ridership, actual ridership numbers from our drivers and our teams to saying that, and schools, that we may have had on one bus 56 eligible riders, but actually on a, on a, daily and weekly basis, that may be 42 or 38. So we, we base it on our, on our eligible ridership, and then we kind of adjust it from there. So our planning process is actually following an airline model of book overbooking our routes, no. is what it sounds like to me. We're planning for less riders, hoping that that's the case, and not having but, adequate capacity. So we do take historical information in the sense that we our, our supervisors and our writing assistants that have been working in those areas for some time, they, they um, have knowledge of what ridership has been in previous years. So it's not, um, it's not something that we're just arbitrarily picking. So what would you say that percentage is? And I'm not looking for an exact number, I'm looking for a ballpark. Are we over I don't know booking if we can by 20%, 10%? So, Ms. Hand, I would say that, again, from, be, from the beginning of the conversation and the information that was provided, it's not in a percentage in that way. I, we've asked these uh, same questions as well. If, if your question is, do we plan to overcrowd our buses? No. We don't plan to overcrowd our buses. Um, that's not how we plan. It's in terms of um, primary versus secondary. When primary, we look at um, kids in terms of three to a seat who could reasonably sit in a seat. And then at the secondary level, we know that the kids are bigger and we know that they have more stuff. And so that normally that's two to a seat. And then we account for that how many buses we need then based on the number of kids who are eligible, the number of kids historically who have ridden a certain bus, and then then we look at over time, over the weeks, especially as school gets started, whether or not there are adjustments that need to be made. That is the same process that is uh, used um, year in and year out. We know that there are times when um, kids don't ride the bus and then we end up with more space. Those calls then are that I saw a bus, you know, going down the road and it only had, you know, 12 kids on it. Um, and so why are you uh, having that route? Conversely, we know that sometimes we have 
uh, kids with more stuff than what we had anticipated, more instruments, more um, uh, things that they're uh, carrying. Sometimes even on an elementary bus, you have kids with larger book bags than what we ex anticipated, which means that the bus seems uh, more overcrowded. But in terms of planning, we don't plan for our buses to be overcrowded. So we I've plan seen, for sure. um, three to a seat at the elementary level and two to a seat at the secondary level. I understand that, and I haven't seen the numbers recently, so I was hoping they've actually improved. It's been you know, a year or more since I've seen the planned ridership numbers. Mm -hmm. I had to request those via a Public Information Act request to get those numbers. I'm mm -hmm. um, hoping those would be available to the board for increased transparency. But I did receive them for the Northeast area, and those planned numbers far exceeded the capacity on those routes. And by far, we're not talking one or two per seat, as could be expected with some, some fluctuation. We're talking three, four to a seat at the secondary level. So my question is, again, as our role is to make sure you have the appropriate resources needed and to secure the appropriate capacity, where are we? Do we need to be including additional funds for greater capacity within our fleet to ensure that, you know, to address the overcrowding? Because we are hearing it. I get messages from parents constantly of kids sitting on the floor, standing in the aisles. They're exceeding three to a seat, or at three to a seat at the secondary level is ridiculous. How do we address it? What is the plan if we're seeing, I, I'm gonna request those numbers again because I want to see that we are planning adequately to make sure that our kids have safe rides to and from school. And I continue to hear they're not isolated incidents. I appreciate the efforts of everyone to make adjustments when you get reports of problems, but it feels like we're moving kids around instead of addressing the container. The container is too small, we need to address it. So I would like to see those numbers, um, particularly in, in problem areas, but overall, and to know the answer to my original question, which was what is our planned ridership percentage as a percentage of capacity? That's a very easy number to get. It's a key metric we should be following and tracking to ensure that we're providing adequate resources and to ensure that our buses are not overcrowded, because they are. We continue to hear it, and again, they're not isolated incidents. We'll work with the superintendent in providing that information. Once again, we, we want to make sure None of our buses are overcrowded, and we work with uh, the schools and the teams to make sure that's the case, but we'll work with the superintendent on your request. And I have an addi additional question, but I'd like to share the, the floor with my colleagues so that they may ask. Sure. So, um, Mrs. Causey, then Mrs. Miller. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. McCray and uh, Mr. Smith. So am I to understand that there are no numbers that you are presenting this evening? We respond responded to the questions that we had here. So we're, we're following up on those questions as we do with all of our um, other requests that we get. We're providing the information follow up to the board to those questions that were received. And keep in mind that the board received a full report on transportation earlier this calendar year um, that had um, in terms of the accuracy of um, on time um, arrival times, the numbers of students who are transported, the number of routes that are um, given. And so there were there have been numbers that have been provided to the board um, throughout um, this school year. Well, when we've heard all of these concerns, and we're trying to, as Ms. Hen said, number one, to make sure that each child is having a safe ride, um, but also to understand moving forward, do, does your office need more funding in order to do a better job? We need to understand the numbers. Where are we in our performance? Where are the children in getting to school on time? And where, are, and how is that trend? We know there's start of the school initiative issues. We know that there's uh, enrollment that happens as the school year begins, but one would expect to see the numbers of the call center, how many calls are coming in. They should be reducing over time, not being consistent or not uh, increasing. Um, uh, we should be seeing numbers about, um, as, as Ms. Hen was talking about, the capacity and the ridership and how is that tracking over time. We talked last year at the transportation report about having those numbers. You talked about a baseline. Well, last year was supposed to be the baseline, and this year we should see where the trend is. Are we improving? Is that extra 1,000 students not being addressed in the budget ahead of time? We know they're coming. That's our trend. That's what our projections are saying. So we need to plan for that. My questions were more uh, particular around 
um, instruction time. I would like to see the numbers, and I, I would have hoped that you would have ha had this for us as a management report, but I'll make it more specific. How many students arrive at school late every day in increments of one to five minutes, five to 10, more than 10? Um, how many minutes of lost instruction per school? Are there certain schools that are having more difficulties and we need to apply more resources there or understand what's happening? Um, how many minutes of lost instruction are special education students receiving? This is an issue of equity for our special education students to receive every minute that's required under their IEP. And if it's not fulfilled because of late buses, then they need compensatory education. There are things that, uh, that we should know, that we should be receiving. Um, and the other issues were the uh, call centers, call tickets. How many call tickets are you getting a week? How quickly are you clearing them? I'm glad to hear about the communication because that's very vital. Um, but I'd also like to understand what happens when someone says that the bus is not coming. What's happening with our children? I want to know what's happening to the students when the bus is 30 minutes late and the parents have left for work. Those are things that and we need to know. Every one of those items are being addressed when they come to the office. The information about call times, that information was provided. These questions that you're providing now, we will address them if it comes to the superintendent. That's not the questions we got. We answered the questions we got. So I don't want you to perceive that we're sitting here like we didn't come prepared. We came prepared for what was asked of us and what we provide. So we'll, we'll do that. But these are new questions that are coming to us, and we will address them through the superintendent. But I, I don't want Mr. McRae here to, to appear that he's not prepared. We, we provided an update earlier to have some of those informations. If there are new requests that's coming, it's got to come through the superintendent and we can address them. To, to Mr. Smith's point, I don't think that this um, issue is one that has to be um, combative. I do think that we share the same goals. Mm -hmm. uh, we want our students mm -hmm. to be in school on time every day mm -hmm. to have a safe ride. We want our bus drivers fully equipped with the tools and resources that they need in order to get our kids in school on time. We want you as a board to have the information that you need so that you can make the critical decisions. Certainly as we are preparing our budget um, for the upcoming school year, we are asking all of these same questions so that we can make an appropriate budget request. This isn't anything where it has to be, um, where we're um, fighting each other on it. We have, we, I believe we share the same goals. We want to make sure that our bus drivers have, us, um, have everything that they need and that our kids have a safe ride and they have one where they're not crammed into buses. Nobody wants that for kids. Um, it's not a matter of saving anything. We're not trying to save money. We're not trying to do any of that. We want kids to have a safe ride to school and we want them to get home safely. So we do transport 81,000 kids twice a day at least. Um, and then we also have about 808 buses on the road. Much of this information, like I said, was provided uh, at the beginning of this calendar year, so it wasn't last year, but it was earlier this year. And then we provided additional information in the opening of schools report. Some of the call center information was in that report as well. We received questions. We're answering these questions. And then the, the agenda item for tonight was to follow up on the information that um, was asked of us. So uh, uh, we can certainly continue to give the board information. There is no uh, reason why we can't do that. Mr. Virch and then Mrs. Mrs. Miller. Thank you, Ed. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for coming by. Uh, Mr. McRae, uh, I want to thank you for uh, escorting me through the Pulaski uh, offices that you have. Um, how are Mary Jo and Jenny, who are in the call center, how are they doing? Doing, doing great. I'm um, I happen, working hard uh, every day. You may recall it was last month that I asked you for the presentation that was made earlier mm -hmm. um, to the board earlier in the year, and you sent it to me. And there were a lot of interesting information, and it was good for me to have that when I when I toured the operation. Um, one of the one of the interesting bar graphs showed 3,300 calls to the call center in September of 2017, mm -hmm. and then one month later, the number dropped to like 258. Mm -hmm. One month later, whatever was going on on the first day of school got sorted out. One month later. I wanted to ask you if you have a sense, and I didn't submit any questions, if you have a sense for what the call center volume is today 
really two months after school started? I, I, again, I don't have that. We can certainly provide that, and we can actually provide it in a kind of higher quality of information sure. than we did then, in the sense that um, what we were able to do then it was just give, here's the number of calls that came in. What we can actually do now is mm -hmm. actively say, here's the number of calls that came in, here's the number that were answered, here's the percentage, here's the number of calls that were uh, dropped in some way or form. Um, in other words, the, the call didn't continue. That could be for any reason that, oh, the bus came, put the phone down. It could mm -hmm. be anything. So we're actually able to give a kind of higher quality of information now with those statistics. And, and again, if I some may, of that information yeah. was in the opening of schools sure. um, PowerPoint, so we can certainly refer back to that. And that was just provided to the board just a few weeks ago. Well, thank yeah. you. And if I might just ask you um, a few other questions. Um, uh, my understanding of the call center, and you sort of alluded to it, is that if, in fact, numbers of calls go up, they begin to peak, um, the other folks in that office are able to, because of having been cross-trained and because of the um, devices that are on their workstations and the training that they've had, they're able to pick up the phone and begin taking calls as well. That's correct. So the, the voice over IP system enables any number of our staff. I, c I could log in as, a, as a someone to answer calls. So we could have, um, rather than just keeping picking up phones, the system will now take every call that comes in and take it in order. And the moment that Kevin comes free, Kevin gets the first call. Then um, when David becomes free, David gets the next call and so on. So they're being answered in, in the order that they're coming in. So it's much more kind of customer friendly as well. Um, and you can have up to, I mean, we could have 20 people logged in if we, if we wanted to at a, a peak time. Um, so our, our standard team that are answering on a kind of day-by-day -day basis. They will have four, but if um, Kim, who's with us tonight, sees that that volume is higher, we can, uh, okay, Denise, uh, please log in and start answering phones. Now, when I, now when I was there, um, I was actually able to listen to the Mary Jo and, and Jenny actually answering calls. And I only heard one half of the conversations, mm -hmm. um, but it was, it, was very, it was really informative for me to be able to stand there and listen to the professionalism that they brought to handling calls. Um, even uh, an empathetic quality to um, the interaction with the caller. Now, I didn't hear the other side of the conversation. Mm -hmm. I only you know, could hear what I heard when I was there. Um, I wanted to ask you if I could about um, the morning on-time arrivals. In February of this year, in the presentation, the morning on-time arrivals were at 96 percent. Mm -hmm. That's the data that was provided to the board. Is there any reason for you to believe as you sit here tonight, and there's actually a number, it's an actual number, but is there any reason for you to believe that that number is significantly up or down from that 96 percent? I, I, at this point in time, we, sure. what we need to do is, is take the time and mileage reports mm -hmm. that come in and crunch that data. And, and yes, that is still a, 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 a manual kind of report and as a snapshot, but when we get that time and mileage data back, that's when we'll know um, what, 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 what it looks like. And, and just as it was, a, just a, if I may interrupt you, just as it was a knowable number in February of this year, mm -hmm. it can be a knowable number in November of this year. Sure, yeah, Good. and when we get the time and mileages reports, um, that's data that will be compiled. Now, I wanted to ask you, um, when, I, when I reviewed the information in the number of routes that we have, what really leapt out at me were the number of special education routes we have. Now, whether it's, a, it's enough, it's not enough, it's like 200. It's like the low, it was like t low 200s, and we have 600 general transportation <laughs> routes. Are those numbers approximately the same this year? And, I, and it doesn't have to be, I mean, those are pretty yeah. much in the ballpark. They are, they are not dissimilar. So, but we, um, so for example, um, just recently broke up uh, or created a new route for uh, a non-pub school in Columbia mm -hmm. because we take um, uh, a large group of students to there. It, we needed to basically split the route and so that it was more manageable. Um, so that creates a new route. So that, those numbers can fluctuate uh, and change. Um, so, but, but they're, by and large, relatively close. 
Uh, as you know, because while the call center may have been taking the calls of parents, uh, you've been taking some of my calls, and you took one of my calls last week from Villa Crest Elementary School, and I'd been there a couple of weeks before, and uh, one of the staff had a child that rode a particular bus and was concerned about overcrowding. And um, for board members, you heard David refer to, or Mr. McRae refer to, uh, ridership surveys. And um, I had requested a ridership survey on a particular bus route because of concerns that the, that the bus was, was overcrowded. Um, and Dave was, you know, said he'd conduct it and he would, he'd be willing to share it. The results speak for themselves. There's uh, only so many spots to sit in the bus, the size of the bus that it is, and it was a high school bus, and it was, uh, you know, two kids to a seat. And it turned out over, I believe it was three or four days that y'all did the ridership survey. We did two, two at the end of one week and two correct. at the beginning of the next week. Now, it is true that, you know, the winter sports are kind of ending, so who knows whether <laughs> there will be some kids who aren't staying after school instead who may now be riding the bus. But in that, in that instance where, in fact, um, a couple of stops had been, had been collapsed, I think on, like, Park, uh, there were two of them, Canterbury, and I want to say another one was... Um, I want to say Park Drive in Windsor and Canterbury. There were two of them there that were ended up being collapsed. It actually turned out that there, at least on the numbers, mm -hmm. the ridership survey indicated that there were additional seats on the bus that weren't being occupied. Now it's only one route. We have 600 general transportation routes, so you can't sort of draw any conclusions from a single route. However, if you all have questions about overcrowding in a particular bus, it's not unusual for the Office of Transportation to do a ridership survey in a given time. Mr. Birch, uh, let me, uh, yes, let me ask if I can just continue oh, please, to no, move please, around. Oh, please, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Mrs. Miller. Yes, and then um, Mr. McDaniels had his hand up. Uh, we had input tonight yeah. and since the beginning of the school year, and frankly, last school year and the year Microphone? before that. Your mic, yeah. Um, thank you. Regarding transportation issues and, and expressing what some stakeholders thought were the primary causes. So in your words, in short, what are the primary causes, top one or two, that's causing these issues? So we, uh, on any given day, we have, as has been talk, talked about, you know, X number of routes to cover. And so um, there, there can be any number of reasons that could mean that we have to have coverage for, you know, uh, any number of uh, routes that are on any given day uncovered, whether that's it, that there's a vacancy or whether we have um, long-term absence, or whether we have absences on any given day, so that, that we need to cover like routes. That sounds like a shortage of bus drivers. No, so, so what I'm I'm saying is that can fluctuate on any given day. Um, uh, so, so w why why we see um, uh, if we have a a, a service um, that doesn't operate well on a particular day, that could be because there's a fluctuation on any of any of those numbers. Again, we are continually recruiting to have more um, drivers brought into the system, but we are a large system, so there will be there will be people that leave the system, that retire, um, and so we have to replace them. So uh, even though we may hire, you know, 20 drivers in a, over a period of time. So that's a constantly topping up because we have people retiring or moving or going to another job, and that's, a, that's understandable if that's the case. So number one is a shortage of bus drivers. The, the, there's a nationwide, I mean, it's talked about. Um, that so is CPS, that would also be the case. So again, I'm sorry, Danny. A shortage of bus drivers. It's three pieces to that. It's a shortage of drivers, and we certainly have um, individuals who are out on long term they have they've had medical procedures or whatever the case may be and they're out and then as Mr. McCray said there's that other bucket of um, call outs those are the ones similar to a teacher who's and, and let's call out and we need sub drive we need subs those buckets have to be managed each and every day the mm -hmm. the vacancies you sort of know that number and you can deal with that and we have 30 so right now as Dr. Mayo may have indicated earlier that number, we, we adjust that as we have classes, we recruit, and 
that bucket is there and we certainly we we would love to have more drivers so it's not like we're not trying to hire more drivers right. we certainly will hire more drivers we're just trying to understand yeah, as a board I, that's great question what's the problem so it sounds so it's, like it's bigger than just of drivers is number one drivers and what would be number two reason for these transportation issues what would be next our, our, so if we, if we are not providing perfect service on any given day, that's a statistical game. So uh, again, so if you're, uh, if you're looking at the, as Kevin said, the three tiers, if it's um, uh, absences on any given day, there could be any reason, any reason for those absences. We looked at a, mm -hmm. uh, a week recently where um, that coverage fluctuation was up to potentially 20 drivers. So, um, and if you take an area like our southeast, for example, which I know Mr. Virch and many others, and, and Ms. Hen, very familiar with the east side as well, in, in our Dundalk area, being short a reasonable number when they, the routes are so short themselves, you know, where many times those routes, if they were covered by somebody else, you wouldn't even notice it's just another bus that came today because right, the timings are so tight. That's the same issue about the shortage of drivers. So I, I can't let you go on because I know Mr. Gillis will be okay. clocking me. Okay. And so you're using up my time. Okay. Sorry. So let me ask my next question. Um, is it accurate to say to, that the organization, the reorganization that occurred in the uh, Office of Transportation, did that cost over $1 million? Was, was that, who could answer that? We can provide that through the superintendent. I, I would hate to throw a number out now. Uh, but and, and can you describe what, what benefits have we reaped from that reorganization? I'll start with that. Um, one of the things that we heard pretty consistently was um, lack of communication at the lots when, when, quest when questions came in. So now having um, uh, staff there at the lots to address questions as well as support for drivers um, when incidents may have happened, having additional management there to provide support, that has been one. Um, one of the things, David may have a different number two which you asked and I have is, my number two, Ms. Miller, would be some of the actions that were taking place today with the contracts. Getting the radios on those buses, that's going to be huge for us because that that's an efficiency that we can see real time when drivers have situations. We can we can get that information pretty quickly and can provide that information to schools um, and to the leadership that can say, hey, we need to contact parents and say this is going on. So that's an effort that we're we're appreciative of this board and moving that contract forward to help us in that process. Okay. Um, and how much did we spend on the routing software over the last three years? I don't, we have that number, but I, that, I just don't know it off and, the top and of my head. A lot, right? Mm, I mean, that would be a safe. No, a lot. I'd need to. We'd need to get you exactly okay. what yeah. it was purchased off the shelf. Was before I before I came to the same, system. Uh, so same here, right? And yeah. and uh, how effective has that been in your estimation? I think it has been highly effective from the standpoint of our drivers and routing assistants before did a yeoman's job, but making any adjustments, that was a manual process. At least now, it's still a manual process. It has human intervention. The system can help um, plot where students are, and then through the routing assistants, the routing techs, and the, the senior operations uh, um, managers, they can make that ch those choices in a in a faster or more efficient manner than before, and so it just it's we're trying to find ways to make a very difficult job more efficient and easier for our drivers. And certainly, I, I completely have heard the concerns of the the gentleman who spoke earlier. And we we want to show how you know the routing system is not like a rogue system that's just we're leading us blindly. It it has human interaction. It is merely a tool that we use in order to mm -hmm. to be more effective. So I don't want to use more of your time. I'm sorry. Right. But the board has to consider cost versus benefit. Yes. So I understand your your view on that. Yep. Um, and uh, how much do we spend on school bus maintenance? Um, that, that fluctuates, but we had a contract tonight um, that was in the neighborhood of two and a half million dollars. Um, that, that fluctuates. 
that's different, difficult to say because that was the outside work that we can't do in-house, but we have a full maintenance team at, at, at our lots that take care of the lion's share of most of our work. And, and we did have that in the statistics in the previous um, presentation, so I will get that for you. And so, uh, and another question that you can provide later, um, how many buses do we own versus contract out? And I guess also drivers as well. Yeah. So um, if you could provide that mm -hmm. later. Sure. And a follow up to that is, are we moving then towards completely contracting our bus service out? That is not currently where we are. Um, we, we have a, um, we're primarily employee driven bus, buses, but we have contracted routes to help um, with the national driver shortage. We use contracted routes. In some respects, we use it because it's, um, it, it helps supplement some of the routes that we have. So that's not a direction that we have been heading on, and, 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 but, but we use contracted routes to help supplement some of, the, some of the work that we do to make sure that we can drive our efficiencies. Okay, and, and what are the pros and cons to contracting out versus in-house? Well, the, we, if you have a contractor route, um, we don't have to maintain that bus. We pay for every aspect of the service, whether that's the driver, whether it's the vehicle itself, the fuel, etc. It's all part of, part of costed in. Um, we don't have to house it. We have limited, obviously, parking space. We already have 11 lots. So um, if we were to increase our fleet drastically, we'd probably have to have increased bus lot space. So, mm -hmm. so to a degree, sometimes contractors assist us in that way, um, that they, they bring uh, a factor to it that is perhaps something that in a particular area we wouldn't be able to cope with. For example, one of our contractors in the, in the area that works in the Hereford zone for us, we have a small lot there and they have a lot there too. So it actually is a nice marriage. And so, All right, Ms. Miller, this is your last question. And some uh, follow-up to this. So the, there's definitely pros. It might be a lot more, inex more inexpensive to contract out, but cons might be that it suffers in I won't the say quality it's, of I won't say it's less inexpensive. We, we, we pay a premium to contract out. So um, you, you, you kind of pay that premium because you you leverage all that cost through the contractor. I, I think what we utilize it for is, as some of our shortages, we use that to kind of um, fill some of the gaps that we may have. So I don't want to give you the impression that we think contracting is the better way to go because I don't think we feel that way. I know, I know from our research it hasn't showed that thusly. It's just saying that for a system our size and the magnitude of, what, of the students that we, we transport to and where they are, and, and how we can get them in the most effectively. We have to look at all aspects, and I think Ms. Hen said it earlier, we have to look at all aspects of how we deliver so, and find out what's the best way to do that. And some of, sometimes that's with alternative sources, sometimes it's with one of our buses, sometimes it's with contractors. It depends on where the student needs are, where we have the lots, and where we have the students. And okay. why are the routes hold, changing hold let's, constantly for drivers let's, like let's the one on driver to, testified to? Let's go on to the next question. Um, because everybody, there's right. 10 minutes uh, is a, a lot of time. I, I've, okay. I've got more, so you uh, I, I, I'm, I'm sure everybody does. Mr. Uh, McDaniels and then Mr. Young. Yeah, I'll try to be, not to be redundant, but my, I'm just going to ask a similar question in a different way. Um, going back five or six years ago, the public couldn't in, uh, email board members directly. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and then when we turned that system on where, where parents could email directly, when school started at the beginning of the year, as a board member, we were inundated with emails when school started, uh, and 90% of them had to do with some transportation-related issue to the point where I even questioned whether it was a good idea to open it because we were just bombarded. But then after a couple weeks of school, it died down. Things kind of settled down. Now, this question is more, I think, for more for Mr. Smith than Mr. McCray because he hasn't had a perspective, maybe. but. Um, we did seem to reach a sense of calm as the school year moved on. Um, I was concerned when the bus driver that spoke earlier said that each week now seems like the first day of school week where there's still the, the, the level of frustration doesn't seem to be calming down. And I guess my question is, 
does the software system that we're currently using give you the confidence if you go back a couple of years when we weren't using, I guess, this routing, the same thing, and things seem to settle down, is this system going to be able to lead us to this, um, I guess, this calmer where people have a better sense of what's going on? When you compare it, Mr. McRae wasn't here. That's why I thought maybe if you look back to other systems that we were using. The system is not the savior. The, the savior are, is the people. So the people are what make it work. The system makes it more efficient and we can do it quicker. Okay. The, the issue that the gentleman spoke about, which was passionate and, and I believe every word he said, was less system related. It was more so when, when those three buckets that I told you about our staffing fluctuate and we have high numbers. For example, if we have 50 some call outs in a day, what that is, let me tell you what this means for Mr. McRae, all hands on deck. If you have a CDL, you're going to a bus. That's what that means, because we found that information out at 4.15 in the morning. So at that point in time, normal operations just got, amp just got disrupted, because I don't know I'm going to have, and if that, if that 51 happens in one area, or so, uh, primarily in one area, that's a, that's a game changer. So we have to reallocate resources. What Mr. McCray said earlier about the southeast, some of the routes in the southeast are smaller. So when you make that adjustment, you can do that and it almost looks seamless. You can't even really see it. But in the northeast and the northwest, those are areas that are pretty expansive as it relates to space. So giving a part of that route to somebody else, that's disruptive. So what the gentleman was referring to was when, when we have call outs like that, we have to deliver students. So at that point in time, you, you may not necessarily get your regular assignment. You may get your regular assignment and something else because we have to, we don't, we don't have the ability to say, we just won't do it today. We have to deliver. So that, that's why I'm saying that. I don't know if that was totally the system. That was some of the, we have to get personnel what we need to do in order to make the delivery happen that day. But those same challenges were occurring five years ago also with and I'm just not understanding why it might be more complicated now than it was. Or maybe it's not. Maybe the same kind of challenges. I don't, I don't know if it's complicated because, I mean, we understand this. We know it's what it is, and we, we're certainly working through it. It's just now um, we still have to find a way to fix those shortages as it relates to needing more drivers, which is one. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, we have... Fortunately, unfortunately, we have drivers that are in some kind of a long, long-term absences. It's not, we we want to protect their jobs, so we still have to leave that there. And then you have that piece where you may have absenteeism and call callouts. A lot of times in hours that that's not done two days in advance because they don't necessarily accrue the time that way. That's I'm sick and I can't come in. When that happens, we have to reallocate resources to make it work. So it's 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 not new it's what we've experienced all before but um we are growing and we don't have a we don't have a asset shortage as it relates to buses we we have the buses we need we need to continue to keep replacing them and we need to find ways to add in 77 passenger buses where it makes sense so to 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 your earlier question we got to get the configuration together where it makes sense maybe we need 77 passenger buses in certain areas where we can get more students on but it doesn't work in every area because you can't put those size buses in every area because you just don't have the real estate to move the buses around without providing creating incidents and accidents but to mr mcdaniel's point the order of magnitude of the shortage may be different than it was five years ago correct right is that Okay, so Mr. Young is next. See you I, think, I think you've probably answered part of my question, but I'm going to throw it out there um, again anyway. In the document you provided us on Friday, um, it, it mentions, and reading directly says, the OOT has recently faced staffing challenges, which have resulted in reduction of service levels on certain days in particular geographic areas of the county. So that's, as you said, the call outs that you um, mentioned and having to bring all hands on deck. Mm -hmm. And what areas of the county have, is that more prevalent? Um, it, it, it depends on the day. It depends on what time, but um, 
that's my other comment, earlier comment, sometimes it's, it's, it's more impactful in the two areas I mentioned because of the size of the routes. It's just harder to, to double them up. It's just mm -hmm. when you double it up, you, you, you're almost assured that you're going to have some late routes. It may be different in other regions, but it's tougher there. So it's, it's just kind of where they shake out out because not all of the call outs and the absenteeums is going to happen in one place. It could be at all of our, one of some of our, all of our 11 lots, but when you start having critical mass at certain areas, in, in certain of them, it has greater impact than others. Okay, and you mentioned absenteeism. Mm -hmm. So, do we have a um, big issue with absenteeism? I, I don't want to say a big issue. I'm, I'm just going to say we. Unfortunately for us, when we have absenteeism. It's real. It's like not having a teacher in a classroom. It ha and in and, and, and the school, maybe the principal can cover that or the AP. For us, if you don't have a CD, you can't, I can't, you can't cover for me. So it's, it has a little bit different effect. So when that happens, mm -hmm. um, our resources start running bare about what options we have available because every able body is, is a is a term, but it should be every ab able body who has a CDL and who's been properly trained mm -hmm. to be on a bus. Certified. So, yeah. Certified. So that's, that's why it, get, it starts getting complicated. So I don't want to say we have rampant absenteeism. I'm saying that when we have high days of absenteeism that we've had in some of the most recent months, that, that gets pretty impactful. The month of September, for some reason, we had very few. And those days were very, I mean, we didn't have some of the stress levels we have now. It's, this is not, this is not just happening in Baltimore County. It's happening, I would imagine, at every LEA in the, in, the, in the world, in the country. But it's something for us with our size, you can see it more prevalent with the, with the system our size. And before Mr. Gillis pulls the plug on me, um, <laughs> you mentioned, um, well, we have drivers like in the, say, southeast area. Do they mainly stay in that southeast area? Or if they're needed, they're pulled into the northeast or northwest? So we, uh, our drivers um, and attendants do have a, a, they work out of a lot, okay? Um, um, but uh, we will, ha where we can have flexibility to provide assistance. So, for example, um, on any given day, our southeast uh, area um, may be able to, because they have two of their subs that they don't have to put on to a route on that day, they are utilised by the northeast area. Um, so that kind of assistance happens. Um, I know our central area have assisted our northeast area on occasion as well. So we do, where possible, um, uh, help uh, routing assistance the same because they're very knowledgeable about the whole range of areas. They will fluctuate between to give assistance when we can. Okay. And um, yeah, well, not a question, so I don't expect an answer tonight, but uh, one thing that has been brought to my attention um, deals with our ESOL and our homeless students and that particularly like with our ESOL students, they may go through the Welcome Center, they, they will get assigned a home school, but they've experienced a delay in getting um, a bus assignment or transportation assignment. Therefore, they're, they have a home school, but they're not in that school immediately, so they're racking up absences. So just um, kind of a, what is, what is the process? I know you mentioned earlier with new students coming in, you, you can get them on the next day, but I know our um, ESOL and homeless students provide a different and unique challenge, particularly right. where our, say, our homeless student could be in the Dundalk area, but their school, they're assigned to, mm -hmm. to be in the Reistersound area. So we are, you're correct that there are ESOL and, um, our displaced students, they, it's not regular, so you, you can't just throw them into the system and it gives them a bus stop because it's an a, irregular set of circumstances. So they are, they are manually placed um, when it comes to how that, uh, um, how that transportation is put together. So we still um, have a goal of doing that in five days. Um, so that's uh, to, to get people into um, the, uh, a route that takes them to that. Now, a lot of our ESOL programs, as you know, spread over particular areas. 
Um, so um, we're usually able to get our ESOL students on. Sometimes our displaced students, it's a bit more challenging, but again, we have those, those goals to get them uh, placed within that time. Okay, five dates. Yep. Okay. Yep. Thank you. That's White. our goal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to take a moment. I, I'm sitting and I'm, I'm listening, and I just want us to be sure that we're understanding the, the full picture here, because I know that our team, they're being very responsive uh, to what's being said and to some of the concerns. I'm certainly sensitive to the, the fact that we have pockets that we absolutely need to address. We have pockets in the Northeast. We have pockets in the Northwest that need to be addressed. I just am concerned about some of the narrative that's being shaped in terms of having this broad scale or um, a problem with transportation. And I say that because, and not to minimize or diminish any of the concerns that are brought here. We take every concern seriously, and we, can t we take every vacancy that we have seri seriously as well. But we transport 81,000 children twice a day. We have 808 buses on the road every day. And again, I'm not tone deaf to what some of the concerns are. But I also want us to keep in mind that we've had 30 percent fewer calls this year, as we've noted to the board before, than, than we had last year. 30 percent fewer cars when we started the school year. When that first week of school, we had 30 percent fewer calls. And so I hear the one side, and we want to make sure that we're listening. But I also need to be able to share the other side of the story as well. That 30 percent fewer calls, if, if the, pre the problems were as prevalent system-wide in every area as, as being kind of shaped here, this room would be standing room only. And, and there would be a line formed all the way down Troll Street, I'm sure. And so again, this is not to diminish any of the um, problems or concerns that we have. We know we have pockets to address. We know that we do have some vacancies. We do know that we have recruitment fairs and we're trying to make sure that we have buses, bus drivers on tap every single day to get our kids to school. And guess what, they get to school. And so we do know that we have individual issues to address, we have individual um, concerns, and we have pockets in certain areas that are worse than others. So we're not saying that we don't hear that, we absolutely do. But system-wide, I just think that, I, I believe that our bus drivers are doing a great job of getting our kids to school on time, our routing assistants, our assistants as well. They do a great job of getting our kids to school and getting our kids to school on time. And so I just have to offer the other side of the story that I'm not hearing here tonight. Again, not to diminish or to minimize anything that was said or any of the questions that are coming up. I think these are good questions that should be asked. And we should continue to ask the questions. Our team can tell you, I ask these questions all the time. And certainly, we're gathering information for the board and for the public so that we can get better and so that we can have a system. This bus, this transportation piece is an enterprise in itself. And so we just want to make sure that the enterprise, this uh, transportation enterprise is effective, that it's efficient, that it is supportive. And so we're going to continue to work in that vein. I just wanted to take a minute just to share the other side. So we're sneaking up on an hour. We might have even passed an hour. We had a half an hour allocated for this topic. It's a fertile topic for discussions, obviously a fertile topic for questions from everyone. Um, but let's see if we can have uh, maybe a couple of minutes each from whoever else has a question or two so we can move on and keep on our agenda. Mrs. Causey, Mrs. Hen, Mrs. Miller, in that order. Thank you. Um, Ms. White, when you refer to 30 percent fewer calls, what time frame is that? That was the first week of school. That was in our first week of school. Yeah. Okay. So the first week of school, we also had 10 schools that were closed for three days for lack of air conditioning. So is it that we, you had extra buses and bus drivers to move around and so Perhaps that was the reason why what I would like to see, I would like to see is a week by week evaluation of the timeliness of us getting our students to school. And we're supposed to be the board that flies at 30,000 feet, so I didn't feel that it was my job to create the 
blank management report that should be brought to us tonight so that we can understand the trends of what's happening with our students for their safety and for their academic achievement and for equity. Are our special needs students missing more instruction time than other students? These are questions that we need to answer. These, this is information that you should have in reports that you should be reviewing and that it should not be any question I need to ask for you to bring those reports to the Board of Ed. So I would like to see a robust management report on transportation around those issues. Instructional time, safety for our students, which includes overcrowding on buses. We know that when kids are nestled up next to each other, guess what, the elbows start flying and then we're talking about safety issues with students and altercations on the buses. So those are things that we know. And we need to understand not just the first week of school, but we've been in school for several weeks. So what are the trends? Where do we need improvement? We're coming up to the budget cycle. This board and this new board that's coming should have the information in front of them to say, do we need to give you more staff? Do we need to give you more um, uh, funding to pay the bus drivers more, to get them to stay, to get them to come? Those are the, the pieces of information at a high level that this board needs to know to re reallocate the budget as necessary to give you the support that you need. And, and I'll say this as my final comment, when we hear complaints from our uh, parents about the buses, it's about the timeliness or the crowdedness. They love their bus drivers. They love the bus attendants. So this is in no way uh, uh, um, and anything negative about them. We know that staff are working hard and we know that the bus drivers are driving buses because they like to be with our little people. You know, we heard it tonight, they're, they're, they love our precious cargo. So we just want to make sure that we give them the management, the support that they need to do the job they want to do, which is to take our kids safely to and from school. Mrs. So thank N. you. Thank you. Well, Ms. Causey expressed that much more articulately than I could, but I want to emphasize and clarify that by asking questions, there's no ill will mm -hmm. here. You are hearing our frustration, and that frustration we are echoing on behalf of our community because they're frustrated. Again, this is not the drivers. This is not people, a people issue. We know we've got amazing people who work very hard every day to get our kids to and from school safely. That is not the issue here. If there's one question that I think all of us around this dais would ask, it's what do you need? and we are trying to get to the root cause of the timeliness and the overcrowding. And Ms. Miller asked it, what do you need? That's all we're trying to get to, so that we can plan appropriately, we can budget appropriately. We're just asking that, that it really boils down to that. So I, I wanted to emphasize that. I've got some more specific questions. I'll submit those in writing. The, the intent was not to put anyone on the spot. I agree with Mrs. Causey, the, the new board needs a management report with some of these metrics tracked on a regular basis to tell the good news as well as show the areas for improvement. We know there's areas for improvement across the board. We're not trying to single out transportation here, but we know there are issues. We hear it from the community, and we want to make sure that you have the resources needed to address those. So my last statement is more of a, a comment than a question, and to just emphasize we know we're doing a great job and we know there are room, there's room for improvement, but let's work together to address that because we've got issues that are underlying. They've been ongoing for years. They seem to have gotten worse this year. I'm not sure I understand the root cause of, of what's happening with pockets um, of what's going on. But again, I'm trying to get to what you need to be even more effective. And again, it's for our kids to get them to and from school safely, to take care of our drivers because they want the same thing. We're on the same team here. Please work with us to, to make that happen. Mrs. Miller. I'm going to fly through, through my questions here. So if it's something you need to provide answers to later, just say later and I'll move on. <laughs> um, how many parents have given up on BCPS transportation and decided to drive their kids to school themselves? Later? Okay, I have, a, I have several questions from, um, that I received from trans BCPS transportation staff that I want to give voice to. When will transportation employees be able to use their badges to track time worked like all other hourly paid employees? Later. Later. When was the last time the Office of Transportation advertised for full-time bus drivers and attendants? This person says, I've only seen ads for part-time trainees for the last two years or more. No, we're, when we are advertising for um, bus drivers and attendants, 
that's not a part-time position that you're advertising for full-time now yeah okay yep how many open positions for bus drivers and attendants are, are open right now so our current vacancy rate is in, in it fluctuates but it's in the high 30s about 38 okay. yeah and how many permanent contracted routes are there we have currently got 138 contracted routes. Okay. How many temporary contracted routes? Uh, at this point in time, none of them are temporary. Okay. So we have one or two that, they're, like this week, one of our contractors said, we can help you out this week to help cover. That been, I wouldn't even count that as contract, uh, temporary. That's just, yeah, we can help you out for a week. Okay. How many transportation employees or ad are on admin leave or reassigned positions? That, that fluctuates, so we can certainly get that through the superintendent. Okay. How many overtime was, how much overtime was paid this year and last year by the Office of Transportation, and who received overtime? Later. Or the number of employees who received? <laughs> Later. The, the concern that has been expressed is one of favoritism in the Office of Transportation. Is there a training manual for routing assistance? I think we're going to have to put the rest of these in writing. Let me just fly through these. I have not even had the same amount of time as, uh, as people okay, preceding so me. Is there a training manual for routing assistance? For routing assistance as such, not for that uh, routing assistance dispatchers? position. Dispatchers? Training manual for dispatchers? Not a manual as such that we would that I can say, here you go. There is, is or there no, is? No, I, I don't okay. have that as such. For bus drivers in attendance? Is there training? Is there any kind of training? Yeah, absolutely, okay, yeah. Thank you. I think the record ought to be clear. For bus drivers in attendance? Yep, that manual, is, manual. is being finalized now. It w used to um, exist, and we are recreating it as we speak. How many open positions for school bus driver trainers? Uh, at this point in time, we just had a retiring uh, someone just retired, um, and one of our trainers was uh, uh, promoted into a new position. So, so we have no, two. No vacancies. In no, that? we we have uh, two vacancies for and our current level. And okay, Mrs. Miller, you had you had twice as much time as your prior two. I want to give voice board to members. I want to give voice to our yeah, employees. Yeah, so you can do it in writing. We'll post it. Okay, Mr. Stewart, and then uh, Mr. Virch. So thank you. Um, so just as a preliminary comment, Dr. Brown, this might be an area that we could provide or use our data dashboards to provide additional information to a public that I think needs uh, the right story to be, the accurate story rather, to be told to them. Um, and then gentlemen, if you don't mind, uh, could you just share a little bit of information about, uh, I think what was provided earlier in building the contracts about uh, pay and about the differences between private contractors and what is offered there between what we offer. We could get Dr. Mayo back as well. I think it's important as we talk about shortages that the public has an understanding of how we are trying to address that, including pay increases. Our current pay, uh, rate of pay is 15.73 to 22.42 an hour. Um, after eight years of service, you have a longevity step as well. So we have some drivers um, that can, the range can go from 8, 1573 to 2899 per hour currently. January 1st, uh, when everyone will receive their COLA, it will go from 1620 per hour to 2309 per hour. And when you include the longevity, it will go to 1620 to 2986 per hour um, for our drivers. What's the hours? 40 hours per four, week. Four so zero hours per week. Yes. And then uh, we also have to take into consideration when you're looking at other um, LEAs or con um, contractual drivers, they may not guarantee the 40 hour work week. Um, they may not um, provide the retirement plans, um, health care. Um, so you have all those different variables to take into consideration. That too. we provide, that, that we they provide. Yes, don't they necessarily provide. provide. Correct. Okay. And then as it relates to our mechanisms and our strategy for recruitment, can you talk to us about the upcoming career fairs? Can you talk to us about uh, some of your efforts in that regard? Uh, Which I don't think we've heard about yet. As far as recruitment activities, and I also let David chime in. And, mm -hmm. um, 
I have Ms. Lowry coming as well, um, who's over um, recruitment and staffing. We have recruitment events at a minimum once a month um, throughout the county. Uh, we also work with work, workforce development. Um, so there, there are various opportunities that are available. You also have to keep in, in mind that with the drivers, it's a very intensive training process. So in some cases, we actually lose drivers during that time period simply because they're anxious to get started with their work and then they find out other opportunities or they may get their CDL through Baltimore County Public Schools and then they move on somewhere else with better pay, maybe not for all the perks with the benefits, but they move on because of the better pay and they also have, they've already received their Because they see CDL. a larger per hour figure, Correct. in other words. Um, now looking at the long term. Right. So th those are different variables that you have to take into consideration. Um, Ms. Lyra, would you like to add anything as far as with recruiting And then efforts? Mr. Stewart gets one more question. We go to Mr. Birch. You're okay. Okay. She's right. okay. Um, is there anything that we need to know as a board tonight to provide clarity on our efforts as it relates to driver uh, recruitment and retention? Um, we certainly need more drivers and we will continue to recruit more drivers. I think that Dr. Mayo made a great point. The process for getting through, through, through those three phases, it's, it's not always fast. It's not like you come in for an application and you're, you're driving next week. We've got to go through a host of training to make sure that they are skilled and trained to be on that bus to take care of individuals' most prized possessions. So it's just a process and a host of things can get in the way during that process that sometimes are out of our control um, with other competing interests related to jobs. Great. Yeah. Mr. Birch and then Mr. Young. Um, I took a look at that uh, presentation from earlier in the year and for FY 2017 the maintenance costs were 5.8 to about six million dollars and most of that's technicians Salary. salaries mm -hmm. uh, and the other most of that are for parts makes sense it's a maintenance budget secondly with regard to advertising one can simply go around the beltway and go to the pro right by the Providence lot and look at the sign that's out there drivers wanted it's a beautiful sign by the way and it's in color thirdly um, I want to talk about one of those pockets and you know the pocket I'm talking about and it's it's our brown bus at our Villa Cresta and I'll just I'll just because I am on the clock with Ed I'll just tell you yes, you are in my three and a half years on the board I've had de minimis calls regarding transportation it doesn't mean there are transportation issues but I've had de minimis calls very very few I've had very very few emails as well about transportation in our sixth district but what I have I've either rode a bus I've gone to the bus stop and one of the pockets is this brown bus for our Villa Cresta I'm standing at the corner of Ligonor and old and old Hartford Road a, a parent in an SUV pulls up puts the window down and says that brown bus for Villa Cresta that has to stop here that's always late now I had a parent acknowledge that there had been some improvement in consistency but when I was there Friday as you know because I called you from the bus loop mm -hmm. That's a pocket that I would ask that you please take another look at. There you are. Thank you so much. Mr. Young, and then Ms. Adekoya. Um, just really quickly, I mean, Dr. Mayo, you mentioned the um, longevity step. So what is the um, average um, tenure, for lack of a better word, how, of our bus drivers? We would have to take a look at that information. I don't know exactly Later. off the top. So okay. That, yeah. All right. Thank you. I, I mean, <laughs> Miss Adequa. So, in such a growing um, county, in a sense, I know. Okay. From last year to this year, you had 113,000 students, and this year you have like 115,000, and you're catering to 81,000 per bus route. When it comes to that, are you looking at what is all, what also is incorporated after school activities like basketball season, football season, when deciding how many students per bus? The, the currently we don't do a host of athletic events because of um, the demand that we have on our daily operations. It, it spans from practically 5 a.m. in the morning till sometimes as late as 10 o'clock at night because we have evening, night school, and all of that. So for us, it's more difficult. So most of our schools contract the athletics out for it, so that. And that's something in the future that we, as we can build our scale and we can bring some of that in, we will do that. But we're just not at that point yet. So um, as we have growth related to student, each year we get a, a, a allocation related to growth for those students. 
Honeygo Elementary School came online, we got 12 buses to make sure that that, that particular growth of 1,000 students, not all at Honeygo, would be accounted for in our, in our bus fleet complement, and we do that throughout the year. However, once again, that's based on eligible riders, and Ms. Ms. Hen and, and Ms. Causey indicated about how we, we do that. So I hope that answered your question. Okay, it did. And so my other, my other question is, from my understanding with Mr. McCray, when you look at um, students get into school late on a bus, it's as simple as somebody calls out and then you have a bus route already on the way, but you have to change that bus route and add another thing on top because somebody called out. So you do have students waiting, but it's a matter of you're trying to get them to school on time. You're still doing everything in your power. So it's never intentional that students will be late to school. I, absolutely. We're always that's always our intent is to to have students at, at school um and on time in the classroom so it, it really is very what you're describing is how do we piece it together mm -hmm. okay and and that will really depend on whatever um we're faced with at 5 6 a.m in the morning so you you won't know then the, the dispatchers and the writing assistants are piecing together the jigsaw on any given morning in any given area, uh, depending on the call outs that they've got. If they have a, a small number, they only have X number to replace. Um, uh, and Kevin mentioned all hands on deck, then they don't need all hands on deck that day. Maybe the substitutes plus some routing assistance covering a piece of a run, that might do the entire job. If it's a day where there is uh, a heavy um, uh, absence rate, then it may need a lot more complicated piecing together. So it, it, it's impossible to say how is that done every day until you're faced with what you're faced with because you don't know which route you may have to cover. It may be a very long route and there's just no way that you can break it up and make it into pieces. It may be a route that you can break up into pieces and that three stops from that can be covered by this coverage and so on and so forth. So it's a complicated jigsaw that's put together every morning by every individual dispatch team in the area. All I will add to that is very quickly is we prepare for a certain number of call outs. So I don't want you to think that call outs is a new call for us. We, we know that. It's just when we have spikes in that, that that's something that we can't always prepare for as well as we'd like. Well, Mr. Chair. Uh, it's, been, it's been fertile conversation. And as I said, if everybody uh, that has more questions or comments get some writing, we'll get them to Mr. McRae, Mr. Smith, and Dr. Mayo. And speaking of Mr. McRae, Mr. Smith, and Dr. Mayo, thank you all for um, uh, talking with us and responding thank to you. us. <laughs> Next on our agenda is item R, which is board member comment time. We'll start with Mr. Young. And I should, let me, let me add just w real quickly. Um, usually at the second meeting of the month, we have committee reports instead of board comments. Uh, but this November 20th meeting, because it is for many the last meeting of, of their tenure on the board, we're gonna have board comments instead of committee reports next week, I mean, in two weeks. Okay. Um, as already been mentioned, next week is American Education Week. I recommend parents go to your child's school, see what they're learning. Um, if you come across something that troubles you, I would advise you to talk with the school administration, but also come with ideas to help and not just problems. Um, next week also, well, on Sunday is Veterans Day, so to our children who have parents who are veterans, I say to those children, thank you for uh, allowing your parents to serve. Mrs. Eaton. Well, I got a lot to say. <laughs> I no. just, <laughs> no, I'll later. 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 <laughs> 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 I'd just like to thank uh, Mr. Gillis and Ms. White for putting transportation on this week's agenda since it has been an um, issue for some time now. Thank you very much. Mr. Birch. Uh, thank you, Ed. Um, 
I uh, just wanted to extend, uh, if I could, congratulations to Florence Falatko, who is a mathematics teacher uh, at a school that some students from our 6th District attend. It's uh, Cromwell Valley. Uh, she was one of 104 uh, teachers uh, across the country to be recognized with a Presidential Award for Excellence in Mathematics and uh, science. Uh, Florence was a hedge fund trader. Uh, she uh, is a graduate of Towson University and uh, she uh, took time off to raise uh, her son. She's volunteering at a school and the principal sees her and says, hey, you you be a good teacher. And so Florence goes to Towson University. She gets a master's of arts in education and she gets hired right out and goes to teaching. And 15 years later, now she is uh, one of our uh, really, really good mathematics teachers. And she uh, has the kids doing like like uh, mock uh, stock portfolios and things like this to make it real for the kids. And she has this great quote that I think a lot of our teachers would, would appreciate. You're still teaching the standards, but it's real. And we all know if it's real and it matters to us, it makes a difference. And I think that applies to a lot of teachers. Secondly, Art for a Cause, once again at our Golden Ring Middle School. The uh, cause was breast cancer. Um, the uh, uh, career teacher of the year there, Miss Gibson, does an excellent job with her staff. Just a fantastic event. If you get the chance to go, you should go because there is a new narrative being written at our Golden Ring Middle School. I was also able to go and do a trunk or treat event over at our Pleasant Plains uh, Elementary School. I was one of the judges of the trunks. Uh, the candy being given out was blue pumpkin certified as, you know, not allergic to the kids. Fantastic event. A lot of positive energy. Um, uh, Joyce, the principal there, does a fantastic job. If you get a chance, you should definitely find your way there. Uh, next week, uh, American Education Week, I'm going to go to the schools, three of the four schools that I um, went to as a student in the system. I'll be at uh, Hawthorne, and I'll be at Stemmers, and I'll be at our Kenwood. It's going to be a blast if my fellow board members have time. Please get out to the schools in your district. Mr. McDaniels. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to mention briefly uh, an event, a wonderful event I attended just more than a week ago at Catonsville Middle School where their Boys to Men Club had a, their tie ceremony and uh, it fit very well with the star video that we saw where it's a very proactive effort to change the school climate where you had some of the young men that used to maybe dis be disruptive a couple years ago are now very much uh, advocates for creating a very nice climate at Catonsville Middle School. School. It was also a wonderful collaboration between the PTA, the staff. We have volunteers uh, at, uh, on the staff at Catonsville Middle that spend their time with these young men. But then you also have community members that participated in the program. So it really showed Team BCPS, again, a very positive, proactive effort, and I was very uh, glad to be a part of it. Ms. Adequera. In honor of November and giving thanks as well as reflecting, I just want to say thank you to everyone that works day in and day out to make the system run, from the superintendent to the board, stakeholders, operations, and administrators, teachers, parents, communities, and of course the students. We are not perfect, but our ability to continue to try each and every day, we are willing. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Thank you. Uh, first, I just wanted to say, Mr. Gillis, that uh, your comments from earlier uh, were uh, I think well said and uh, um, we would do well to be as positive as we can be to recognize uh, the blessing that it is to be at this point of service in our lives rather than to be negative and cynical and filled with scoffs and sighs and sarcasm that we have a really unique opportunity those of us who are involved uh, to serve and that's been a fantastic journey for me at least. Um, I do want to thank uh, Ms. White and her team for BCPS Works. I think that is another hallmark of your style, which is innovative and creative and problem solving at bottom. Um, you know, this is what success looks like. It goes under the radar quite a bit, but this is happening and it's happening because of good thinking uh, and creative thinking. And then finally, I want to say um, that this um, Saturday at Hillcrest Elementary, um, doors open at 930, but there is a ceremony starting at 10 for one of our own, uh, Mike Bowler, uh, as a remembrance ceremony of his many years of service, even before he uh, came on the board um, to this community. Thank you. Mr. Yulfelder. I'll pay us Very good. Mrs. Causey. <laughs> Later. <laughs> Later. Later. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
I'm also looking forward to American Education Week. I also want to wish well our athletes that are continuing to compete in championships in the coming days. And I also want to acknowledge Veterans Day and appreciate the service of our military that protect and defend our freedoms, including our election process. In that regard, I'm truly humbled by our amazing success in this historic first election for Board of Education members in Baltimore County. We can be proud to be Americans, where we can participate fully in our government, advocating at many levels, running for election, and voting. First, for me personally, I want to thank God for all my tremendous blessings along this journey. My husband, our children, my dad, and all the family and friends that have been amazingly supportive of me and my board service the last three years, and also in the, in the recent campaign. Um, I also want to thank uh, my amazing uh, team. They know who they are. That's for them. And uh, I also want to appreciate all the friends and supporters, church family, and also just the amazing Baltimore County District 3 community. Um, I uh, really appreciate, too, all of the people that I've met along the way, all of the amazing support that there is for public education in Baltimore County. It really is uh, an amazing foundation for our county and for our school system. Um, I'm also grateful along the way for support from elected officials in my service on the board and the support of my campaign, including County Councilman Wade Catch, Delegate Chris West, Senator Jim Brochin, and Comptroller Peter Francho. Last but not least, I'm grateful to Governor Hogan for having the faith and confidence to appoint me to the board three years ago, and I appreciate his continued support of public education. The landslide victory of our campaign sends a clear message that the time is now for the Board of Education to provide effective governance and oversight of Baltimore County Public Schools. The future of our children is too important to do anything less. I extend congratulations to all who had success in elections yesterday, and I look forward to working with all of those elected officials at every level to benefit our students, teachers, staff, families, and community. In addition to continued collaboration with my board member, Julie Henn, I am especially hopeful and excited to begin working with our newly elected Board of Education members, Lisa Mack, Cheryl Pasteur, Makita Scott, Lily Rowe, and Rod McMillian. Congratulations and welcome aboard. To the runner-ups, in these many elections, I appreciate their motivation, their energy, their contribution to the conversation, and their efforts to improve and enhance the quality of education and the lives of Baltimore County students, teachers, staffs, and families. I'm very hopeful that moving forward, the new board can take the excellent building blocks that are here, that we have, and return this school system to a world-class education system for each and every student. We have some amazing building blocks, including the incredible teachers, the support staffs in all of their varieties, and administrators at every level that are dedicated to our students. We also have engaged families and communities, members that support quality public education, and we also have consistent and robust funding from the county and the state. So there are many things that we need to work on, and I am committed to hearing and getting great input from people. Um, and we will be addressing immediate issues when the new board takes place, but I am really hopeful with their energy and engagement, the fact that they've been running their campaigns and out talking to members of their communities, that we're gonna be able to jump in and get some amazing work done. So thank you very much. Mrs. Henn. Thank you, Mr. Gillis. So Tuesday was an historic day for Baltimore County, as voters had the privilege and responsibility to elect school board representatives for the very first time. Elected representation did not come easy. I am enormously grateful for the efforts of all who fought for the right to elect seven of our 12 members. And I'm thankful for our community for taking this responsibility seriously and for making informed decisions when casting their votes. Congratulations to our newly elected members, Lisa Mack, Cheryl Pasteur, Kathleen Causey, Makita Scott, Lily Rowe, and Rod McMillian. As the incoming representative for the 5th District, I remain committed to working with our superintendent, system staff, school communities, our new board, and other elected representatives, including my partner in the 5th District, Councilman David Marks, to bring about the common sense reforms needed to ensure student success. Through increased accountability, transparency, and responsiveness, and by working together, we will bring about the changes we want and need for our schools. Increased safety, improved facilities, smaller classes, and smarter spending on what is proven to improve student learning. This is an exciting time for our county 
and for our students, parents, teachers, and administrators. It has been an honor these past two years to give our stakeholders a voice on the board, and I look forward to continuing to serve. Thank you. Mrs. Miller. Thank you. Congratulations to our incoming board members. You're going to have a couple of great incumbents to help, help guide you along. Um, the Board of Ed answers to the citizens of Baltimore County. We give a voice to the public in how the school system is run. We're the only people in the entirety of the system that answers directly to the citizens. That's why the board exists. Our job is oversight and direction of the superintendent and the system. Prior to the current composition of the board in 2015, we had little diversity of thought or opinion on the board. Most votes were conducted with no public debate and concluded with unanimity. Smooth meetings with predictable outcomes were decorous and non-confrontational, but did nothing to motivate public participation. The past three plus years have been different. Lots of debate, diversity of thought, conflict, public displays of board business, even some lack of civility and decorum at times. Public participation has grown tremendously, go figure. We now have people campaigning to serve on the board. I thank every candidate. It's a great personal sacrifice to campaign and to serve. Bringing a dozen individuals together to make decisions as a board can be messy. And that's okay, but be forewarned, it may get messier before it gets better. A lot of changes are in store for BCPS in the coming year or more. To our teachers, thank you to all who have bravely come forward to tell us what needs improvement in the system. You've spoken on behalf of many times more teachers who did not come forward. I have protected teacher anonymity and empathized on the difficulties you face while trying to maintain both your morals and your job. Sometimes those things have been at odds. There will come a time in the near future when you will have a properly functioning board and you will need to stand up for truth and your morals. If everyone does it, risk is reduced for each person. To the incoming board, we have paved the way for new possibilities, served as examples both good and bad, and lobbed the ball in the air for you. Serve with integrity, independence, humility, and backbone. Your decisions will impact hundreds of thousands of people in Baltimore County for years to come. Let this new board be the board that it's remembered and modeled after by other counties across Maryland and beyond. While it hasn't always been easy, it's been an honor to serve the public, the students, parents, and teachers as a member of the board. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hayden. Mr. Gillis, I've been very careful tonight to keep my comments uh, to a minimum, but I have saved my time up. And I've been able to pare my comments down to about 45 minutes, Good. which should be okay with everybody Good. here, I'm sure. All in favor? Ah, uh, uh, that's uh. not a votable issue. Check your rules. <laughs> One of the things you find out being on the board is you get to listen and talk and find out lots of viewpoints that are different from your own. And that's really what it's all about. That's what we as citizens in this great country have to realize. We're here because of our diversity, because of our different ideas, because of different things that we want and we want to do. And we are blessed to be able to express these different opinions and express these ideas. Baltimore County, I've been here a while. Uh, actually, I counted up and from last time and this time, I, I've got over 14 years on the board now. Uh, and. Uh, I see somebody there nodding who I've seen for that whole time uh, and his wife. Uh, and uh, one of the things you get to is finding out what the county's all about, what the community's all about. And what it's all about is great people. People who talk to one another, who disagree with one another, 
and many times, not always, but many times find a way to, to agree. The one thing in my last quick closing remark is that, uh, did you see him smile when I said that? <laughs> uh, is that we have to remember in everything that we do, we have not good but great teachers out there who make such a difference in our school system, and we are blessed for that. We've got a super staff out there. But the other thing that doesn't get mentioned as often, we have this unbelievable group of kids. These kids are the bottom line. That's what we're all about. That's why we're here. We are here to say, how can we make these kids the best that they can be? That's our job. That's our challenge for the new board members. Remember that. What can we do to make these kids the best that they can be? With that, Mr. Gillis. Thank you, Mr. Hayden. Our next meeting is November 20th. We're adjourned.